Peace and blessings, family. This is your brother, Asar Imhotep, with the Madhu Andela Institute for the Advancement of Science and Culture. Here again for another conversation. Let me mute that sound real quick. Um, I appreciate you for joining me today. Um, as advertised, this is going to be part two of the conversation that we are having regarding the various types of connections uh, between West Africa and uh, the Nile Valley, ancient Nile Valley civilizations, and how this conversation in terms of relationship is had on multiple levels. So, um, so, okay, just making sure everything is live over there. And uh, so I appreciate y'all for um, waiting on me. Uh, I had, you know, a few technical difficulties with this other um, computer and lost track of time. So um, I am here and we're going to be starting a little late, but the information will be the same nonetheless. So first and foremost, I'd like to shout out everyone who is in the uh, chat and who are listening live but aren't necessarily in the chat. So uh, people like Omar Reed, uh, Marquise Kidd, Aku Kromanti, Niger Valley Civilization. Um, who else is here? Maribontas. And I know I saw someone else. And then Brother Chavez. So peace and blessings to you all. And again, to those who are not uh, in the chat, but who are watching. And I know that in the past, we've been having issues with the sound um, periodically. I don't know how to fix that. Uh, I have eliminated that is interference coming from uh, any other kind of devices. It is itself uh, dealing with the computer and there's a fix for it. However, I am on this kind of low budget Chromebook and the normal fixes for that you would have for that type of issue on a PC, um, it, it can't be done on, on this. So I am in the process of still trying to figure that out, but um, hopefully it won't be too bad uh, in this go round. So I will not delay any further let me close some windows here and peace to brother Wujawu, peace sister maika peace uh dre dog the torture <laughs> uh y'all on these names peace of don williams peace to olu oshun um and anybody else i may have missed so uh, let me just go ahead and get started. So I will share my screen. Because we do have a lot to cover. So let me change that. And so now, <coughs> excuse me. I will wait till it shows up on the other computer. And we should be good. Uh, Maika one says it's Tamika. And so I'll, I'll just call you Tamika from now on. Uh, peace of Sister Jolanda, Zachary, and Peace of Sister Emmy Kett. Thank you all for joining us this evening. And without further ado, without further ado again, um, let's get busy. So today's lecture is West Africa and Ancient Egypt, their relationship in context part two. Yeah, I know I need to buy another uh, computer, but, uh, you know can't right now so but i could if y'all 
you know, donate and all that other good stuff. So it won't be any interference in the future. But anyway, uh, as always, well, in, as far as the past few lectures, a lot of this information is in my text, uh, Aluja Volume 2, uh, Chiana Into Religion and Philosophy. If you do not have a copy of this yet, shame on you. Uh, we're going to excommunicate you until you get back into our good graces by purchasing the book or whatnot. So we're going to have your family members uh, ignore you until you have the book in your hand. Anyway, uh, Chena, Chena into Religion and Philosophy, Volume 2 of Aluja. Some of this is in there. Some of this is actually in um, my other book, Nesubiti, King and Ancient Egyptian. And some stuff is in Aluja Volume 1, and some stuff isn't in neither of the books. Um, so, but you will have it here uh, today. <laughs> and hold on one sec. Yes. So uh, most of this information is in these uh, two texts. And then there's some information that is not in these texts. So if you haven't gotten the text, go to asarmhotep.com and purchase it right now. Um, if you have rent to pay, forget your rent, uh, purchase the book and tell your landlord that you had to do it. Anyway, we'll continue. So before I move forward, I have a few corrections from the last, uh, well, yeah, from the last lecture that I did, which was on the blackness of the ancient Egyptians. <clears throat> and so, and that is first and foremost, when you saw this image here, uh, the brother on the right is actually from the Karayu, uh, ethnic group out in Ethiopia. And so I said that it was Beha. And so uh, the source where I got this image from had it mislabeled. But this is uh, a brother from Ethiopia on the right. And of course, this is Amenhotep III uh, on the left. And this person also mislabeled Beha is an Afar, uh, also from Ethiopia. But showing this so you can see again, the, the hairstyles of the ancient Egyptians and, you know, the different tribes and ethnic groups that belong to the makeup of the ancient Egyptians. So I have brother uh, Yakro Yao out of Canada to thank uh, for these corrections. And, I, and matter of fact, there was another correction by Sanjeti. Um, I have to correct that in the next video dealing with um, the gender assignment of one of the, the, the mummies that I, uh, discussed in one of the previous uh, videos. <clears throat> so before I continue, I want to highlight this uh, comment from Dr. Neil deGrasse Tyson, who we know is a world-renowned astrophysicist. Uh, on his Twitter feed in 2015, he made this comment. He says that our common sense is not derived from what is true in nature, but from the limits on how our senses interact with nature. And a lot of this conversation, you know, you hear certain individuals talking about it's common sense. And in using the term, um, our good brother Chief X uses the term common sense science. And I wanted to you know, highlight the notion that common sense and science are virtual enemies. And the reason why is that because we get comfortable in our quote unquote common senses that um, it, our common senses makes us uh, biased towards our own experiences. And we believe that something can't be simply because we haven't experienced it as such. And so this is why common sense is the enemy uh, of the scientific process. And so reality is not obligated to conform to your beliefs. And so this is why we have scientific processes to go beyond 
our human biases and, and senses so that we can ultimately get to the truth. And so um, with that said, this also applies even to our notions of history and things. And so we're not making these arguments aren't made up because we want to have some kind of feel good association with ancient Kemet. This is simply based on the data as it is presented, as it has been left to us in history. And so it 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 requires us to use tools and systems of analysis that uh, go beyond our simple common experience. And this is the kind of thing in which we will see uh, today. So as I noted in the previous conversation, when we're talking about these relationships, these African relationships, they're, they're, they're done on several different levels. And so um, in the last video I showed this, I had you know these in terms of levels, but I reworded it to say relations. So when we're talking about these West African and East African, uh, Nile Valley, uh, you know, this Northeast African, Nile Valley, ancient Egyptian, ancient Sudan, erotic connections. It is it is based on four types of relations. So we're talking about the first one being archaic relations. We're talking about the common ancestry of African people due to the fact that humanity springs from the Great Lakes uh, or the South of Africa. So you you have a connection simply because you know, these groups are the ones who did not leave, per se, the modern borders of the, of the continent of Africa. So there's a kinship there that is um, uh, multi-layered and, and very archaic to the beginnings of human history. Then you have the Saharan relations. And what I say here is many of the West and Northeast Africans are related through common ancestry who lived in the green Sahara and migrated to different locations, South, West, and East due to the desiccation of the Sahara beginning around 6,000 to 3,500 BCE. So there was some migrations coming from the Sudan and Chad and the Nile Valley into the Sahara. And when the Sahara started drying up, um, you know, bef you know, at a period there was green Sahara, there were rivers and lakes and all types of wildlife in the Sahara. But once the, the drying ha started happening, it started pushing and forcing these different human groups and animals, you know, further southwest in all directions um, outside of what we now call the Sahara. And so as a result, you know, a lot of these people who who intermarried, who exchanged languages and customs and whatnot, they dispersed. And so there are some archa uh, archaic customs and languages that are built from that inter-Saharan, uh, those, those, those Saharan interactions. And so thirdly, there's the linguistic relations, common language relationship due to shared pre-dialectical ancestral language for, for Y'all should know by now that I go by the model that I call Chiena Into. It's the relabeling of Theophilo Benga's and Jean-Claude Mboli's Negro Egyptian um, and then other language families. So you, you have relations. Again, it's related to the archaic relations, but more so on the linguistic level strictly. And so then you have the Bronze Age migratory relations. Uh, these are relationships due to migrations in trade during and after the pharaonic um, historical period. So this is this isn't the Saharan relations because this comes after, and so this is during the time of pharaonic Egypt and after uh, Egypt has failed. That there's there have been migrations to different parts of Africa from these particular um, um, people. So just wanted to remind you of that and to keep that in uh, your mind uh, when, when you know, talking about these discussions. So uh, our initial research question is, do African-Americans have ancestors who were the descendants of ancient Egyptians? <laughs> and so, you know, that was, we answered some of that in the first video where we showed that there were migrations 
coming into Nigeria. And we also dealt with some migrations and the documentation of that going as far as uh, uh, Guinea and Senegal or Senegambia, I should say. And, um, and so now we will do a little focus on the, the modern state of Ghana, not ancient Ghana, but the modern state of Ghana. And we'll revisit some, some things going back into Nigeria. So <laughs> I, I read this last week, but this, since we're dealing with Ghana and I didn't deal with Ghana, um, the, the two weeks, uh, before it is important that we do this. So you would have these conversations with certain individuals who spoke with certain individuals who happened to live in Ghana and swear up and down that there's no documentation, there's nobody claiming that certain groups that are in modern Ghana did not come from, from Kemet. And that is a lie. Uh, here's one of our great scholars, Ai Kwe Arma, who is, uh, a, is someone who studied under Shekanta Jop, has also translated a number of Shekanta Jop's text, um, but he doesn't have permission to publish them from the publishers. Like he has translated some, some articles that a lot of us don't even know exist in, in things of this nature. And he's also written on ancient Kemet as well as uh, created a lot of novels based on um, Egyptian history and things of that nature. So within that context, uh, he, he says this, you know, during um, an interview, so to speak. So he said when he when he's talking about how he got into the writing and the study of ancient Kemet. So he says, now I had to I had grown to adulthood. He was talking about his early childhood uh, before that. Inside our larger history, I was undertaking life journeys of my own. And though I had imagined other paths, I was moving into the future as a writer. The more I learned about our history, the clearer it seemed to me that if I wanted to write, I would have to study it more seriously. Since all available evidence indicated that the narrative of our social history was at the center of our art, of the art of our poets, storytellers, and spokespersons. He's, he's giving you a little clue here that if you really want to understand the history of an indigenous African community, um, you have to go to their commission, poets, storytellers, and spokespersons. Not everybody who's in the society belongs to this guild. And so he knew that he had to go to them to get his history about his own people in Ghana. I followed the trail of evidence backward in time. It led me to the oral traditions. The oral traditions took me back to traditions of migrations. Those traditions, beginning with acknowledgments of places reached by groups traveling under pressures too extreme to adapt to, referred to their earlier place of departure. Sometimes the reference was simply the great to the great river or the great water. More frequently, the traditions of migrations uh, mention Misri, Misuri, or Luti. Those are just other names of the area now known as Egypt. Though in ancient times it went by other indigenous names, Tameri, um, beloved land, Tawi, the two lands, and more often Kemet, the black nation. And so this is in the text, who were the ancient Egyptians? And so he, he's saying that, you know, in order for him to begin to write and, and tell the stories of his people, he had to go do some research with the people who are responsible for keeping the history of his people. And this is when he discovered certain stories about migrations coming from Egypt, which was at the time locally known as uh, Misiri. And so this is actually, you, so we can tell by the label that is used, what time periods these people left, because this is the time during like the, uh, like the late New Kingdom and going into the Greek period, because this is what the Semitic speakers called it. And so the word Mitziri means the two lands. It's just, it's what we call in linguistics a calc. It's a loan translation. And so as I showed uh, two weeks ago, 
other stories were using the same name. And so you can see that these 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 migrations, these waves of migrations happening around the same period at the times of the invasions of Egypt. So <clears throat> as I showed before, this is some of the routes. Um, and these are some of the trade routes for ancient Ghana. And as you can see, they were going through the Sahara, dealing with folks in North Africa and, of course, going into Egypt. And we will see that, you know, in later on in our discussion, the evidence of this. And so as I recommended the last time, you know, here are some texts in how to evaluate oral traditions. And so if you're serious about the study of Africa, you're going to understand that there are. Uh, the vast majority of African people do not have written text. And so you have to deal with their oral traditions. And so you're going to have to be able to know how to analyze these oral traditions. Your common sense is not going to help you here. You're going to need scientific tools of analysis. And we have accepted methodologies for evaluating oral traditions. So no, we just don't believe folks just because they say some stuff. We put it through the ringer just like we would do any um, written text and we would have to do a philological analysis. So again, these are the, the locations and routes in which African-Americans were taken from. And so in these city, this is like Nigeria, the Ivory Coast, um, going into Niger, then Sierra Leone, the Cote d'Ivory, um, Senegal, Senegambia, um, the Congo, Angola, and then over here on the East Coast uh, from Madagascar, Mozambique, uh, and um, Tanzania, going into and, and going to certain parts of Zimbabwe. These are where Africans were stolen from. And so we come from a multitude of ethnic groups. And by this time, during the transatlantic slave holocaust, there were already migrations and settlements from, you know, uh, from the B.C. era going into as late as the 1300s coming from the Nile Valley into these different areas. So the, the people who who had migrated out of. Uh, ancient Kemet had already traveled to these locations, settled, and in, in many respects amalgamated to the, the the folks who were already here. They already created and began to be a new people, but certain customs and ideas were kept. And so um, we will deal with some of them. And so, of course, modern Ghana is where, you know, the, uh, the Asante, the Asante kingdom, you know, they were heavily involved in stealing Africans and bringing them and, and selling them to um, to the Europeans. And so there's 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 very few empires that were built off of slavery. And the Ashanti kingdom is one. The Benin kingdom is another. And the uh, kingdom of Congo is another. And so uh, for the most part, everybody else were just victims. Um, you know, of, of probably petty personal raids, but in terms of an actual building of a kingdom, the Ashanti kingdom, the Benin kingdom, and the Congo kingdom was built off of slavery. So, <clears throat> excuse me, something that I want to mention in terms of evaluating certain ideas in terms of how do we know that uh, how do we know that certain things have traveled? Because when, when people are talking about migrations coming from Egypt, first of all, they expect the, the culture facts to be the exact same as what you would see in Kemet. Not understanding how certain things evolve once it leaves its, its, primary location. And so I, I, I have a slide up here of Lil John and the Eastside Boys to kind of make this 
uh, uh, analogy understood. And so what people don't, you know, unless you're from the South and especially Atlanta, you know, this concept of this high energy crunk music, you know, started really in the early 90s. And, you know, it got more popular in the mid to late 90s. But, you know, of course, you know, if you're in a region, you're kind of hip to certain things before it is, you know, kind of pushed and played in, in other locations in, uh, in the United States, for example. And so when you get this, this energy and, and music or whatnot, it starts to change up once it hits the West Coast. And so you see this phenomenon emerge called uh, crumping, which is this high energetic, you know, uh, kind of wild but organized, you know, uh, dance moves. And crumping comes out of the, the clown dancing, you know, uh, out of L.A. And so that stuff, you know, was going on in the 90s as well. And I want to say that the word crump, you know, there's some stories that it comes from a church acronym. And I think that has been added later. Um, but the argument here is that the concept of crump more than likely comes from crunk music and things of this nature and how it changes, you know, once it comes to uh, L.A. And so but it there's when you get to, you know, when you're dealing with it in in Atlanta, it's just a wild back and forth, you know, kind of high energy, you know, almost mash pit or, uh, you know, saying type of movements. But once it's through the, the West Coast, it becomes more organized, but still has the same high energy and things of that nature. And so <clears throat> but the the people on the West Coast already had you know, the uh, uh, kind of history with this kind of dancing and stuff to this nature. And so these these things kind of just merge and then it evolves into what we see today in terms of crumping. And now crumping's all the way in Japan, in Sweden, in places like this. You know, so stuff travels, it it settles in an area, it, it becomes something new, but we can still kind of trace these elements based upon the path of 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 things and in, in, in how we see it. So, you know, I think this is tied eyes right here. The the one of the it's, it's like one or two people that found it crumping, who started crumping. And this this is the guy here. And so um, you know, we should be all familiar with these types of dance moves. And so just want to keep that in mind when we're having these types of discussions in terms of evidence, in terms of migrations. And so you'll see these subtle changes uh in in the way that the cultures express themselves, you know, once certain things have migrated from the the point of origin. So we'll be dealing now with some ideas, some some ideas that are common between the Akan, the Ashantis, um, in modern Ghana, and of course ancient Kemet. <laughs> So we showed this before and showed how the um, how we have, for example, this Nakata artwork and how we can see the similarities in the artwork in similar motifs in sub-Saharan Africa today. And how on this left hand side, this looks like a seat, but it's not a seat. It's a headrest. But the, the similar designs of the headrest become the stools that we see in in um in west africa and especially in ghana and so on the right is a is a throne actually um some will say the stool uh but this is a headrest but they they transfer the design um into things <laughs> And so you see the same thing with these design types. And so you've seen this before. So these are what, are what we call like these box step pyramids that you will find in Kemet. And this is, 
you know, a a uh, a mosque and where a famous person is is, is buried nearby um, in in Gao, you know, d- dealing with those that ancient, you know, uh, a, a Songoy and Timbuktu and all of that other kind of stuff. And so these kind of designs, Africans weren't designing stuff like this on the West Coast until these people started coming from the Nile Valley and 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 Middle Eastern areas, you know, bringing Islam. And so these these building techniques are are from that region and they brought it here to um, to Timbuktu and things of that nature. Um, when Timbuktu was 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 heavy and strong. <clears throat> and so the first thing that we're going to deal with is royal names in the Shinu. And so if you're not familiar with the Shinu, the this is on the left hand side is, you know, a wooden Shinu. And uh, you're probably more familiar with the French name uh, cartouche, which is a word for bullet casing or, bu- or bullet shell. And so for the for when the French came and took over uh, uh, Egypt, when they saw these things to them, it reminded them of a bullet case. So, um, <clears throat> but it's not a bullet case. This is what the Egyptians called a shinu. And so the shinu houses the name of the king. And so the king on average, has five names. And so you can see if for this world example of Thutmose the third, that um, these are, you know, his five names. But the ones that are in the Shinus are the ones that they were more known for, uh, more known as. And so this is the Nesubiti name, the king name here. And this is Men Kepera. So that is his kingship name. But his birth name, the Sarah, the son of Ra name, here is uh, Jehuti Mes Nefer Keperu, here. And so um, you know this, it, it is the early representation of the sign is a tied piece of rope. And so... This again, these are the consonant cl- or consonants in sequence that represent this sign here. But this sign here has two pronunciations, and so it is shinu or shin, and then rin. And the word rin means name, name of the king, or just name in general. And the word shin is a dialectical variation of the word ren. But there's a, what we call a paronymic or not paronymic. Well, paronymy is involved here, but it's called the rabus principle. And so there's a word shin or shinu that means rope and to tie. But they use that as a rabus. There's also one meaning to encircle. And so they use these concepts to refer ultimately to a word meaning name. So it's telling you the name of the king. So that's how you read it. The king's name is. So, you know, in many respects, you can almost look at this as a uh, a function for those of you who are in math, you know, f of x. Um, but here are some manifestations in African languages of this word ren, meaning name. So in tree, they say jin. In Shiluk, Ren. In, uh, let me find another one. Panjama, Ren. In Bantu, Rina, Nina, Dina, Ina, Gina, Zina. In Fanti, Zin. In uh, Zande, Rimo. And in Sango, Iri. The second syllable has been lost due to weak ex- accentuation on the syllable, on the final syllable. And so... When we're dealing with the tree language, <coughs> we notice when we do these comparisons 
between the ancient Egyptian and the tree language that there's these correspondences here. So remember, so this is the sh sound and this is the n is in Nancy. And the sh corresponds to H in the tree. So troubles need, here be in need of, yeohani, to be needy. Shinit in this word for hundred, oha, hundred, second syllable lost. But in this word, shini, rope, hama, ohama, rope, cord. And so this N not only corresponds with N, but also corresponds with M as in Mary. So shini, storm, ahum, storm, shini to rival, to quarrel, ham, quarrel, et cetera, et cetera. Even with the, the regular S, because sh and S interchange in Egyptian. And so it's the same thing. S, sin, sin, inhale, smell, homemade to inhale. Shin wus to cook, to boil, huru to boil. And so we we've set up these um these correspondences to show you that in the tree language, what we're saying as shin is going to have either an HM or an HN consonant sequence between these two. So <laughs> we note that the word Oheni, o Oheni, chief, is reflected in the emblem representing the soul of the nation, known as the Ohenwa, the royal throne. So Ohenwa, Oheni, and Shinu is they correspond here. And in the Yoruba language, they say Oshin, chief. And so when you're looking at going back this, it's not only the name, it's a rabus for the king, the commander in chief. So when you read this and you have the name of the, the person, this is king, chief, Tadank Ahmed. King, chief, men kepera. And this is just a side note because I may do and expand on this in the third presentation. But the, uh, the Oheni or the chief, just like what you find in ancient Kemet, is also a uh, son of the sun. And meaning the sun deity, you know, which is really just uh, in Yame or in Yan, they'll say in, in, in certain areas. And there's a there's a, a title of in Yame, in Yame, uh, in Yam Kopon, you know, the great shining one. And and here the king, one of his titles is Ohiniye Awiya. The king is the manifestation of the sun. And so just like the sun, what they mean by this is that like the sun, um, his authority and command radiates across the country, across the village, across whatever. And so this word we is cognate with the word Ra. And so they are there's someone that the king is Ra is the, the son of Ra. But in 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 amongst them is Amin Ra or Amin. And so, but that's a different conversation. And so we won't get too heavy into that right now. That's just a side note. And so getting back to the thrones of the uh, uh, the Ashanti, the Akan, the, you know, um, folks or whatever. <clears throat> this is, you know, an excerpt from uh, the text, African World Studies in the Cosmological Ideas and Social Values of African Peoples. He says that stool, this, remember we showed a, a, a stool um, earlier. And so we're talking about the ones that are associated with royalty. This one, the king's stools. That stool, the symbol of his power, is what the famous Ashanti priest Anokye described as the soul of the nation. It is the sacred emblem of the tribe's permanence and continuity. The chief as the occupant of this stool represents all those who have occupied it before him. He is the link, the intermediary between the living and the dead. 
for according to the conception which the Ashanti share with other Akan tribes, the dead, the living, and those still to be born of the tribe are all members of one family. And it is the stool that binds that family together. And I have a whole expanded conversation of this in chapter 14 of Nesubiti, my 2016 text. And I encourage y'all, if y'all don't have the book, of course, to get it. But for those who have it, to reread chapter 14. Um, and, you know, a lot of this, you'll gain more insight into what we're talking about today. So this this throne, this uh, seat represents the soul of the nation. We'll see why that is um, in a second. And so here's the Shinu, the Ahinwa um, of, you know, a, a Ashanti Akan throne. And so they mislabel it a stool, but it's a throne. And this is in the shape of the Shinu in the shin rings. It just, the difference is that they have a seat on top of it. Now it's going to be hard to really kind of picture this and see the same things. But, uh, or, and this is just a variation in ancient Kemet. And so the, the, the ancient Kemites, this is from King Tut's tomb. They would have these stools, but theirs fold. The bottom of theirs fold in terms of these types of seats. And, and but among the Akan, they didn't have the folding type. And so, but when you see the Ahenwa, the throne, next to the representations of the Shin, this is the normal Shin ring, and the Shinu is just the elongated version of this uh, uh, glyph here. And all of these represent the name, the soul of the king. And so what, what is going to be the focus here is what do we mean by soul? And so remember that all of this has to deal with names. And names are the soul in Africa. And so <laughs> the throne represents the okra, the soul of the first king who initiated and started the kingdom. Every king that sits on the throne is only a representation of the first king who um, made a covenant with a certain spirit in that place for protection and cooperation. And so in Kemet, this word is ker or kar, kur, however you want to pronounce it. It's, it's for soul and essence. In Akan, it is okra. In ga, kla. In Belin Kushitic, in kira, soul life. The kwara, in kira, soul life. Tayo, in kira, spirit. All of these are the same. It's the essential essence, the spirit of the individual. And so when you go and deal with Ghana, you're not going to escape ancient Kemet because they're dealing with the same concepts. And so now you get some layer of pronunciation. A lot of us will say the Ka, but it's not the Ka, it's the Kra, the Okra, the Inkera, the Inkeri, Inkera. And so it's represented by these um, arms. This is the hieroglyph for kra or ker or kra. We'll just say kra or kra um, for the duration of this um, conversation. And so the, the kra, the soul, all it is, is the name of the person. But it comes from the word for name, comes from a word meaning to call, speech, to say something. And I deal with this in the text. And so here are just some variations across uh, related and relatable languages for this term here. And as I noted, you know, previously, the word for name has to deal with the idea of to say, to mention. 
it's a, the, the word for name in African languages has to deal with uh, verbal commands to mention something. And so when you mention something, you identify it. You have a word for it. And it is whatever word that comes out of your mouth to identify things, that is its name. That is it is represented its essential essence. And so you can see the semantics exist in the tree language as well as in the ancient Egyptian. So we see um, this word okra to name. Then we have in tree, bedin to name. This word din is the word rin, which is a palatalized form of this word kra. These are both the same word. So to name, to name, uh, to name or name. And so you had this word to say or to call. Both the same words. It's the same semantics. They're built from the same process. And so you see this even in other related languages who may have abandoned one or the other processes. But knowing the knowing the names uh, uh, by way of the historical comparative method, and we can establish that these are cognates, we see the same we see the same thing here. So in Hebrew, Shem, name, fame. In Arabic, Ism, name, fame. But they don't have the root of this meaning to call or to say, but it survives in Tri, Asim, proclamation. In Yoruba, Esun, proclamation. Yoruba, Thesun, report. In Swahili, Sima, says speech. So we know that this Sima is not from um, um, Arabic because it's a word for speech, which they don't have. And so when you understand this, uh, a lot of this is going to be very important. <laughs> so the, the, the relationship between to call and name is made more clear in these representations right here. For example, in Yoruba language, Daruko, to mention, to mention the name of. Arabic, Dakara, is the syllables are switched here between these two, to mention. Assyrian, Zikaru, to mention, to name. In Hebrew, Zikar, to remember. <laughs> In Egyptian, Seker, remembrance, memory, call to mind, to mention. So when you, it's giving you some insight in what a name is. It is an mnemonic device to help you remember, to call to mind certain things. And so all of these concepts are related. So here is an individual. He is a scholar and he is also a king in, uh, in Ghana. And this is Dr. Anthony Ephraim Dancor. And in 2013, he released his second edition of this book on the right, which you see here. African Religion Defined, a Systematic Study of Ancestor Worship Among the Akan. And this is a very pivotal text in understanding the, the kingship processes and just uh, Akan culture. Uh, nonetheless, I cite this uh, heavily in Nesubiti and in Aluja Volume 2. And so... Uh, this is just a good book. And I, I was hip to this book by Dr. Jahi Issa. So uh, thanks to Jahi Issa, who, when this the second edition was first released, uh, got me hip to this and um, has been a value. And he has some other books as well that are just as uh, informative. And so, you know, if you have a book club, I I'd, get this text. So. So what we have here, this is no guesswork. He's actually been initiated and made king. And so he informs us a bit about these, these concepts in terms of the okra, for example. And in this text on page 54, pages 54 and 55, and uh, thanks to uh, Ahmed, uh, <laughs> Ahmedix82 for um, your donation. It is uh, very much appreciated. Um, and, you know, I'll try to keep up with the chat, but, um, you know, kind of reading and focus. So, uh, but thank you for your, uh, donation. <laughs> so, 
Uh, in his text, he talks about uh, this philosopher, Kwame Gayeki, uh, maintains that the okra is located in the head, although in general, the Akan believe that the seat of the okra is the shoulders or that the shoulders balance the soul in the head as the head. The seat of intelligence sits on the shoulders. Still, the fact is that to call anyone by name is to call the soul of that individual. And since the soul is an intangible agency, it is assumed that the dead has appeared in spirit. So when you, you're going into, in, in Nesubiti, I give other citations where you can find this, this uh, semantics across you know, Africa. The soul is the name of the person. And so the name, the soul in among the uh, the icon, besides the word jinn, which is a dialectical variation of the word kra and okra. And so they're telling you here to call anybody by their name is to call their soul. This is why in African traditions, also cited in, there's plenty of citations in Nesubiti, that the, the king's name and things was kept secret. Why the gods' names are secret? Because it's believed if you know the name of an individual, you have the power to activate the soul of them and to make the individual do your bidding. That's the you know indigenous kind of primitive uh, mindset and association between these co concepts. <laughs> so in Again, we're dealing with the Ka in um, ancient Egypt, on the Kra. And so you see these types of representations. For example, uh, this one here, the statue of Harab Ribra. And this is in the Cairo Museum, and this is from the 18th dynasty. And so the word for, remember, let's go back. So he says here, the seat of the Okra is the shoulders, or that the shoulders balance the soul in the head of in the head as the head so the okra is you know kind of equivalent to the ori in the yoruba tradition and so for those of us who are familiar or, or who deal with you know the yoruba traditions your your, your kra is your ori it deals with the head but they in akan it is the or it is the head and shoulders and so you see the same type of representation in for example, the artwork in ancient Kemet. And so this word, remember that kra is the arms and the, the, the hands, but they also emphasize the shoulders here. And so in the tree language, krado is shoulders. And so you have this extra uh, syllable here. And then in Middle Egyptian, we have a different variation of ka is the voiced variant. Also with a uh, final uh uh, morphine here, probably for, you know, saying for body parts uh, here, for shoulder. And so these these ideas, you know, are born from a common, from a, a, a singular tradition. And so we see why this is the case, because again, paronymy is at play. So remember from earlier conversations, I talk about how paronymy informs the culture it shapes the culture and paronymy is this notion that words that sound alike or or is similar in pronunciation somehow must be born from the same they must be related and because in the minds of the these ancient africans these terms must be related that they create culture based on this understanding of the relationship between these words that sound alike. And so this is why, for example, you have, you know, karut to carry to support. You can see the 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 glyph here with the you know holding up on the arm on the head. And then cut thought, kari to think about to plot. So this is why in the tree in, in the Akan tradition, the okra is also associated with the head because it's dealing with thought and consciousness and so of course also the kra soul spirit personality essence of a person 
also meaning to say all of these concepts, although they may be from different, um, these two terms, these terms here, um, the, the thought and to think about and soul, spirit, and to say actually may be related. Because when you're talking about speech and, and words, words are just the outward expression of thoughts. And so, but to carry to support, that's something different. But because these concepts, you know, are, are pronounced in the language similarly, they believe that they are related somehow. And that's why you see things like this. And, and they manifest the, amongst the Akan in the way that they do. So Modupe Odoyoye in this text, in this article, in this text, uh, Traditional Religion in West Africa, he says, when we're thinking about the, the Kra or the Kla, he says, when, when we can think of Kra or Kla as consciousness, the part of a man that responds to a calling. So remember again, when you call the name of an individual, you're calling their soul or spirit. And this is, as I discuss in Eluja Volume 2, in Chapter 12, when we're talking about a spirit in African traditions, we're talking about an essence of a, of a being, of a person that can respond to a name. The, uh, the concept of magic speech, etc., is very critical in understanding the the relationship between the name of a person the name of a thing and being able to command and magic and all of that other kind of stuff we don't have time to go into that but that is discussed in uh nesubiti asarm hotep 2016 and it goes into greater detail in aluja volume two so this is why i'm saying you got to get aluja volume two if you want to be the envy of your friends, get Eluja Volume 2. I'm just putting that out there. Anyway, so, but also, this, this is part of cattle culture. And so, the word kra also deals with, because again, we're dealing with the head uh, in, in cattle culture. And this is, this is the sign for a cow's head. And this is the, the pronunciation of the cow's head. So you see here that this comes from cattle culture. They're, they're, they're saying he's the bull. And so, you know, we deal with in Nesubiti the relationship between the concept of a bull and a king in ancient Egyptian. And so there are, uh, there are many parallels between the icon divine kingship and this. But the ancient Egyptian explains the the icons uh, stuff the, in a ways that the icons can't. <laughs> so moving on, we mentioned beforehand this migration of Fulani all throughout you know modern history for the past three to five thousand years. Uh, actually, before that, we can we can safely say up to six uh, to seven thousand years. The the people who we know as Fulani have been migrating back and forth between North Africa, the Middle East, and West Africa, what we're calling West Africa. And there's some who trickle down and came into these areas, so you know them as the Afar. Who, people who we saw in Ethiopia and things, but this is their primary migratory route. And so this is Madupe Oduyoye, and so this image comes from this text, the sons of God and the daughters of men, an Afro-Asiatic interpretation of Genesis 1 um, through 11. So um, it's important to understand how names play a part in tracking uh, human groups throughout history. And so we dealt with that in the last uh, video in part one. So I'm just going to emphasize again that these pastoralists, these nomadic herdsmen and things of that nature are, again, they're all over uh, Africa and they bring with them certain culture facts. And so this is a representation on the right-hand side of the God set. 
in the ancient Egyptian pantheon. And you see in his hand this wasp scepter, what we call wasp. And in the Yoruba language, this is pronounced ashe, the ashe uh, scepter of, of power. And but in Fulani, they say was. And so we discussed that in 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 uh, Nesubiti as well. So but, you know, this red skin in such as nature that you see associated with is a representation of these folks here that you find all up in ancient e Egypt. And some of these people moved into Canaan and and became who we call the Hebrews and mixed with those folks. And some of, you know, moved further in and became the Haparu. And then, of course, we know the Fulani and Full Bay. All of these are the same people who've been mixing with folks all up and down Africa and the Middle East. So. <laughs> uh, we can see these representations of those wasp scepters and staffs, you know, in early Saharan art. And so this, these are what you see in later Nile Valley civilization. But remember what I talked about in the beginning that you know, a lot of what you see in the Nile Valley comes out of these Saharan cultures. And when the desert began to expand and it was pushing the people out they they pushed them out into places like chad into nigeria into modern ghana into and of course the Nile valley and back into the sudan where these folks originally came from and so you'll see all in the saharan rock art a lot of the motifs that later become stylized and becomes pillars of ancient egyptian you know, art and motifs. So this is just one of those uh, things. So this is from 6,000 to 7,000 um, BP. And so this is what I mean that these, these signs of authority are old. And so you see this in the Nile Valley, these, these same staffs. So you can see the hook over here. And so this is in 3,500 BCE in a tomb in Heraconopolis. And so um, it is, and notice that they're always painting themselves in that Egyptian reddish, you know, saying colors and things. You see that even in the, the artwork here. This one isn't a color version, um, but in color, it, it is these, these reddish black. It's the same, same color scheme that you see in ancient Kemet when they depict themselves. So as I showed this, the last one, and I asked y'all to name, to guess which one is the Egyptian staff. And so these are from three different locations. And so but because we answered it, I'm not going to ask you the question. I'll just tell you um, um, right now. So this is the, on the A, this is the Egyptian. B, this is in Senegal, and then C, this is in Ghana. And you see the staff here in Ghana has the um, a, a very detailed and stylized symbol of set. And so these were uh, picked up in like the late 1800s, early 90s. There's no Egyptology in Ghana. So there was no benevolent Egyptologist who went to Ghana and said, hey, you should carve these and make it seem like the, the set emblem in ancient, um, uh, in ancient Kemet. That's not how this works. Remember that the Fulani and folks are everywhere in, in Central North Africa going into the Middle East. They migrate back and forth uh, uh, during the seasons. And so... Um, you know, this is just the next slide showing where you can find these. So in the Egyptian staff, of course, in the Cairo Museum, and then the Fulani or the Pool of Senegal, um, and then Nanakana of Ghana in the museum in Dakar. That's where you can find these, these items.
And so, again, notice the jackal head on the one from Ghana and the hook on the bottom of the staff from Senegal. So these are these are African emblems. And so, again, this is a representation of the God set in Ghana. We move now to the meanings of the Ankh. And, um, and I had to put under here, I already did a presentation on the meaning of the Ankh, but uh, I had to put this in here because it's, you, you find it circulating everywhere that the Ankh means a womb or a phallus or a womb and a phallus combined together. And that is further from the case. Um, but you can see these representations of how we pronounce it as Ankh. And so you see this symbol and it's a word in the language meaning life and to live life, be alive. Anku the, or Inkwa, the living. Ankh, person, inhabitant, citizen, living one. Ankwa, person, citizen, living one. So these are just different representations of the word Ankh in um, the ancient Egyptian language. So we know that this is the this is where, how it's spelled out. And these are the, the classifiers or the determinative for the word. Um, and then this is just the word, the triliteral representation of the Ankh by itself. So again, we're dealing with the Akan. The, the Akan have the Ankh as well. And so I wanted to show this first. This is the this is a sign, a a, a, a Akan hieroglyph um, that is called Kumkum Duakum, the tree of firmness. It refers to the tree of God, the abode of the resting place of his Kra. Again, we introduced to this Kra, the spirit of God, became a symbol of a steadfastness and a stability and the support and the backbone in times of need for the people who ship, who um, uh, they're supposed to be worshipped, the God. The God was addressed as Chwe Duampon, Lord of the tree, on whom we lean and are never and never fall. And so this is a uh, a symbol of this this tree and the backbone, you know, saying of God. And it's a representation of his steadfastness. Because remember that, you know, their God is Nyame. And you can say Nyamin. And this is their version of the word Amen in ancient Egypt. And you know the word Amen, there's a verse, the word that means hidden. But you notice also that amen means the the steady um, to to remain firm, fixed, and so they're playing on words here. You know this eternal hidden being that we can rely on, who's 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 stable is is a is a symbol of stability, and this is what you find even amongst Asar. So I have a whole chapter on Asar in uh, Nesubiti, and you will see that this backbone, the Dejed symbol, is you see the same markings on the Dejed uh, symbol, and it has the same exact meanings and associations with the deities there, because it was first associated with Ptah and then associated with Osiris. And so, but it's also associated with the Ankh. And so in the uh, a con, remember what I said earlier. When stuff travels, they will take the idea and then put their own spin on it. And so these become full out Aquaba dolls. And Aquaba is two words Aqua or Aqua, and then Ba. Ba meaning child. Aqua meaning life, the life of a child. What the Akan will do is a, a woman who is infertile, she will uh, go to a priest and the priest will recommend that she put these Aquaba dolls, wrap this around her, her, her waist and back and walk around with the Aquaba doll. And this is supposed to align her with the spirit of a child. 
And so that she's walking around as if this is the child and that the spirit of a child, the okra of a child will enter in her body as a result of doing this ritual. And so here's some early in, you know, photos of some Aquaba dolls, is all these different styles of them. These are unk. This word aqua is unk. And so you see also, <laughs> as as you saw from the citation, and, th and that citation has to deal with a relationship between kingship, divine kingship in Egypt and uh, uh, and in Ghana is the name of the text or amongst the Akan uh, by Mariowitz. And in Egypt, you see the same representation. And so again, the Ankh with the Dejed pillar. And so this is uh, a pillar, a tree, but it's also dealing with the spine in the human body. And we'll see um, this in a second. And so you see the same representation in um amongst the Akan, amongst their Aquaba dolls. That tree, that the jet pillar, they put uh, uh, on the back as a way that you see in the loop of the head and things of that nature in um in their representations. So it's aquaba and aqua is the word for life, person, living being. And so as I discussed in the Luja volume one, the unk symbol is the the thoracic complex the loop here is the uh of uh, this last rib what they call this you know the circular rib that that connects the spine you know to the um the sternum here and so and these are the shoulder the, the beginning of the shoulders the clavicles here and you notice the backbones it's where those marks come from these these four pillars here, they're representations of the spine and the, the, the bony, the, the bones of the spine and how they are here. This is where you get the idea of the unk from in terms of its shape. The earlier representations of the unk was the loop of a tied piece of rope that happened to uh, shape like this. And so this is discussed in the Luja volume one. And there's actually another text which I discovered, which also came to the same conclusion by a professor of Egyptology, except he argues that the unk is the thoracic complex of bulls, not human beings. So my argument is bull, excuse me, is human beings, and his argument is bulls. But ultimately, this is is the body. They're both the same, regardless. When you look at a bull's um um, body plan in in the in the uh, the human body plan as far as the the uh, vertebrae is concerned, and so we we get into this you know in proto bantu kua inhabitant and person of unk living person inhabitant member of a group soldier chikam life chiku unku man chui inkwa akua life induala ong life. Kikongo Zingu life, Kikongo Inqua self. In the college and language, they say Ki self, Ki self. And so um, the root actually is this K sound, where the Kwa, you know, saying is. And so the semantics, we see the semantics here in both Chibantu and in Egyptian. And so Ankh, earth, land. And then we have chi, ground, country, underneath. Unk, living person, inhabitant, member of. Chi, inhabitant, person of. And so this chi is the root here that comes from K, which, which, which survives in chi as inkwa or akua. So when we said akua ba, the life of the child, that's what a kua ba doll is. So... Um, amongst the Akan, they, they also have Inkwa, just like how you see in Kikongo, Inkwa meaning life. And so what does Inkwa mean? Uh, Reverend Dr. Emmanuel Kingsley Larby 
in the nature of continuity and discontinuity of Ghanaian Pentecostal concept of salvation in African cosmology. It notes that as one critically examines the prayers of the Akan in the traditional religious setting, one cannot help but come to the conclusion that the overriding concern is the enjoyment of inqua, life. This is not life in abstraction, but rather life in its concrete and fullest manifestation. It means the enjoyment of long life, vitality, vigor, and health. It means life of happiness and, and felicity. Inqua also includes the enjoyment of ahonyade, possessions, prosperity. I know I'm pronouncing that incorrectly. That is wealth, riches, and substance, including children. Inqua also embodies asamdwe, that is a life of peace and tranquility and life free from perturbations. I highlighted this life, vitality, vigor, and health because remember in ancient Egyptian, the greeting to the king uh, is unk uj, or, or the, the, like the F that is to wish the king unk uja seneb, uh, life, prosperity, and health. And so we can see this word unk or inqua amongst the uh the icon has the same meaning as all three of the the representations unk ujasaneb in um the ancient egyptian <clears throat> so now we continue and move on to a moon and as i stated before nyakapon is the is a, is a is a in some texts, you will see that it is uh, viewed as a separate deity, but it's not a separate deity. It is Inyame. It's Amen. It's just a title of Inyame. So Nyakopon, viewed as the sun god, as the giver of the sun's fertility, is symbolized by the ram. Um, in... Which text do I deal with this? Uh, it may be Aluja. I don't think it's Aluja. Because I think I have a separate article uh, showing the relationship between Amun and, um, and, and and Yame, et cetera, in, uh, in the text. And so I know that I'm, I have an updated version that's coming out in a book that's to be released uh, later on this month, but, um, but, you know, some of this is dealt with in the Luja volume two as well, but this is a representation of Amen or Amen Ra in the Ashmolean museum in Oxford. And you can see the horns here of the, uh, Ram. You can see the Ram's face, uh, here. And, and so Nya Kopon, again, Nya means to shine. Ko one and poem great. So it's the great shining one or the soul shining one and the luminous one. Nyame. You could say nyam as an M or nyan with the N. But this is symbolized Amen's Amen in um amongst the Akan is symbolized just like Amen is symbolized in ancient Kemet with the ram and the ram's head and so this is during the 25th dynasty kushite period that you see the ram amen amen was the central god coming out of nubia amen is a nubian god and so but it it is more famous in egypt but its origins is in the sudan and so they they reestablish, you know, um, in Yame, in uh, in in Kemet, you know, and in in his priesthood, so to speak, especially during the twenty fifth dynasty, the twenty fifth Kushite dynasty. And so this is, you know, like a, a gold. It looks like a big head, but it's not. It's a little piece of jewelry uh, of, of gold of of Amun here um, with the snake, you know, saying the sun because we're dealing with Amun Ra ultimately and this is uh from nubia so in the in the napatan period of pianki and this is during the marotic 
civilization. You see Amen and Amen Ra still prominent. And so pay attention to, again, we can see here. I don't know if y'all can see this, but I wish I, sh I should have blown this up. But notice, again, it's the ram's head, and then he has that, that typical ancient Egyptian collar. And at the bottom, it has these shells at the bottom of the necklace here. This is going to be very important for our conversation. So we see Amun, Amun Ra in the Kushite period, the Kushite Marotic civilization. And you still see, you know, a stylized version, a different version of the same necklace. And so during the Marotic period, you see Amun Ra still ahead of the pack. Um, this is from a, a, a jury of, uh, from the queen, uh, the uh, Amun Shakato or Shaketo. Um, Yeah, Aminish Saketo. Uh, this was the daughter of a queen and the wife of a brother whom she survived. Uh, her successor was her daughter, Aminitore, who is mentioned in the Bible. I need to reword this. But um, here you see the representation of Amin as he has the two plums that is typical of Amin, the sun disc and snake, again, because we're dealing with Amin, Amin Ra. But Amun Ra may not even really be the pronunciation. It could just be Amun, and the word Ra is a classifier determinative. But um, we will uh, save that discussion for later. So you can see this representation of this Kushite, you know, princess. This is during the Marotic Kingdom at this point. And so, but again, I don't know if you can see this. It is these cowry shells at the bottom of the necklace that is is represented in this piece of jewelry and so i'm building up to something here <laughs> again another from the area of queen amina shaketo in the marotic period from 35 bc to 20 bc this is a gold fused with glass ring and you see these this those necklaces that is typical of ancient Kemet, which you find all across East Africa and Southern Africa. Um, but notice again these cowrie shells. The cowrie shells are very important because cowrie shells you find cowrie shells all over West Africa, but they don't originate in West Africa. They were, they were used as currency in things. You'll find it all up in, for example, your Yoruba tradition there, used even in divination. So you have cowrie shell divination and things. We even put cowrie shells on our, and this may be just a, um, uh, a diasporic thing, but in terms of, you know, our, our, our divination tools here. But cowries do not, originate in West Africa. They come from East Africa and the Indian Ocean in the islands and from those areas. So um, taking this uh, citation here, the presence of cowries in Africa could be traced back as early as the 8th century. They came from the, the Maldive, uh, Maldive or Maldive Islands in the Indian Ocean to West Africa through North Africa to the Middle Niger in the 11th century, spreading southwards to the Guinea Forest and then to the Niger Delta. There were two types of cowries in circulation at the time. Capri annulus, a larger species which was preferred in the West while the East was more inclined to the smaller pieces called uh, Capri monete. Both are species of sea snails a marine gastro mollusk in the Sopridae family called Monetaria moneta. In Nigeria, cowries are called different things in different languages. The Igbos call the large cowries Nwefe or Akpokpo, which costs one third of the smaller ones called Ayole. The Yorubas call it Owoye, uh, 
uh, the Fulanis call it Sedere, and Bini, they call it Bosies uh, or Igvo. And so, um, and this is actually inaccurate in terms of when they come into Africa, because as we just saw, this is from 35 BC. These are calories here. And, you know, this is uh, around 10 BC. You can see the calories. But earlier, you saw them even in the ancient Egyptian um, <laughs> um, uh, motifs. So calories have been in, uh, in use in ancient Kemen for artwork and even monetary. So this is where we get this stuff from. And we'll, we'll deal with this in a second. And so I cite these two citations because I'm going to do a whole presentation on how cowrie shells also, because this may be part three, can tell you about the migrations of people coming from the Nile Valley into, uh, uh, into West Africa. And so in this one here, this one text, the Introduction to Anthropology, 1926, it says cowrie served as a medium of exchange in Dahomey. These have been introduced from the East Coast. The shellfish which they are made are made not being found on the West Coast in terms of Africa. So these aren't West African. So every time you wear some, some cowrie shells, they come from the Indian Ocean. They come from India, those places, Madagascar, Mozambique, you know, saying those area. That's where they come from. And so this is the stuff that was being imported. They were trading using this as currency. Uh, the ancient Egyptians was using this as currency in India, and uh, even China, and, and of course, into places like Punt and things of this nature. So anyway, although Egypt has provided almost the earliest evidence of cultural use of this money, cowrie shells never played any prominent part in the lower Nile Valley. The Indians who traded with Egypt used cowries for money. The Chinese who also traded with Egypt at a very remote period used tortoise, probably cowrie shells for money. This system dates uh, as far back as the 28th uh, century BC. So we're talking about 28th century. This is 2800 uh, BCE in terms of cowrie shell use. And so the vast majority of these cowries come from um, ancient Egypt and um, the Sudan into West Africa. And then um, later on, when Europeans come into, because now the Europeans are dealing with Egypt and the Middle East, who also have a doubted cowrie shells. And so, <clears throat> and yes, the brother Unk Benu, he says, there's a golden cowrie shell necklace in Tudak Amin's jewelry exhibited in the Cairo Museum. Exactly. And so, this this is a sign in terms of these uh, uh the trade that was going on and so when i deal with the um the the uh the calvary shell lecture this is going to be a totally separate one i'm going to re-emphasize this uh in that lecture so i want to give you some of this the ancient the the when you when you look into yoruba and evo and and the the ashantis when they count in calories, they don't count in the same way that they use in their native language. They count in the way that the ancient Egyptians count. They're using Egyptian counting methods when it comes to calories, using the sexesimal um, uh, system. And so we'll, we'll get into that at another time. But I just wanted to emphasize this, that when you see that, on the cowries or whatnot, these shells and representations. This is one of those those necklaces that you would see. This is a real necklace, not just in the artwork itself. And these must be representative of the cowrie shells that you see in those those other areas. These are different type of shells. Sometimes they use cowries, and sometimes they use these kind of bulb uh, things. So um, this is one of the from the Kandasi, also from uh, Mero, the Merotic period uh, in in the Nile Valley. So when you go to West Africa and you go into places like Yoruba land and Benin, what do you see here? This is not from ancient Kemet. This is in Yoruba land. This is in Benin. This is Amun. You see the same uh, ram's head. 
and with the uh, the necklace, the the representation of the necklace uh, that you see uh, in East Africa. That's because these ancient uh, a guild of blacksmiths migrated from Egypt uh, and Moro into West Africa, and they brought these skills into Nigeria, in Benin, and into uh, into Ghana. So remember that the Rams, those, those associations with Amun in Ghana is not native to that area. That's due to migrations. And so the, the guild really took off. Um, <laughs> the guild really took off in, in Nigeria and places like Benin. And so we see these other representations. Here's a pendant from the 17th and 19th century through the 17th through 19th century of the Edo people. Again, Amen, ram head, uh, with, the, with the collar that you see that we saw in, um, in Moreau and uh, which we find in ancient Kemet. And so it's important to, to note that you do not independently create and think of these ideas. You know, that's like me saying, like, if I saw uh, the Khoisan, a Khoisan, you know, uh, Bush, you know, person in, uh, in Namibia, right? These are hunter gatherers in Namibia. And I see one of them walking with a Transformer shirt with an Autobots logo on the front and saying that they created that independently of the the united states and the autobot you know uh transformer franchise and stuff to this nature that's that's not how this works you don't independently create motifs like this you had to have interacted if i see a Khoisan uh hunter gatherer walking with a transformer autobot shirt we know for a fact that somehow somebody from the united states or Europe interacted and gave that person the shirt. And so in this instance, you it's the same thing. These these people in, in Nigeria and Benin and Ghana, they did not create this off of their own imagination. People from Egypt, people from Sudan moved there. And, and as these guild, this is where you get in these stories of we came from Egypt. We came from Sudan. This is these artifacts that, um, and there's no Egyptology in the 17th century in, in Nigeria and things of this nature. They, you know, they don't, they don't, they're just getting to deciphering hieroglyphs around this period and, and doing digs and stuff to this nature. I'm not even sure they even decipher erotic at this time yet. And so this is this is uh, those pieces of evidence. Again, here's another one. You know, a metal collection shape, U-shape, worn by da 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 da. This is in um, uh, I forgot which museum this is in right now. But this is a plaquehead. Again, when you notice that when they come over into West Africa, they change the style a bit. And so this is a uh, so that one that this is just a flatter, you know, this is the same image that we saw earlier. And so, you know, they're imitating those bells at the end of the collar here. And so, you know, this is the, the introduction of the, the, like the cowrie shells into, into West Africa for currency and stuff to this nature and brought into the artwork and things of this nature. They stylize a lot of stuff, but this here is from Lagos, um, dating to the early 16th century. Hieroglyphs is not deciphered yet. There is no Egyptologist. There is no, there's no um, Egyptologist. There is definitely not no Christians and Muslims trying to uh, inform and put into the head of people of, of, of modern day Nigeria and Benin, etc. In put in their heads that they are some great people and connected to the ancient Egyptians. That's not how this works. And so 
um this is those things and those conversations that like this is one of the reasons why i can't take these folks serious when they're talking about there's there's no connection and that there's that you people aren't descendants of these people these people came here lived, married with all these folks in these areas and their descendants are the ones who were snatched up in the transatlantic slave trade and was brought to the caribbean brought to the united states brought to brazil etc and so we can't we can't take these folks uh serious who ain't willing to do the um willing to do the studies and and things and and, and to that nature and so um even even and this will, I will expand on in the in the other presentation but I just wanted to show this side showing that even Ogun comes from this area and so Yoruba Ogun the Orisha of blacksmiths the the god of war and the god of iron and all of this the yoruba did not invent metallurgy they got metallurgy from the sudan they got it from egypt and when those blacksmiths walked uh over into uh uh what is modern day nigeria and benin they were creating those bronze and uh statues and 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 created a guild there they were doing the terracotta and things of that nature and so you have goon, copper objects in Egyptian, ginu, ogunu, metal pots and vases. And so there was a guild in Egypt and in Sudan, which traveled all the way into the Middle East and all of this other kind of stuff. And so the fan goon, vunu, the blacksmith, ham, jabakuno, the evil spirit who built the iron furnaces, and hasa, makeri, blacksmith, fan, gan, iron, Arabic, Cain, Smith, Hebrew, Cain, Cain. So when you talk about Cain and Abel and the Cain and Abel, so Cain is a blacksmith. He created tools for farming. And when you read the story of Cain or Cain, it is um, about the, the interactions and the conflicts between Cain, the blacksmith, the metallurgy, the civilization, the building traditions, and um, the uh, enable or uh, habel, the uh, the pastoralist, the nomads, and so what they were saying in Genesis uh, concerning Cain and Abel is that Cain killed their tradition of nomadic herdsmanship. They wanted to live the life of nomadism, but the, those civilizations made it hard for them to continue walking around and, and feeding their herds because they would always be in conflict because their cattle would eat the crops of the farmers. So it's, it's farmers against pastoralists. And in Egypt, the story is reversed. So the pastoralists, represented by Set, is uh, they kill. Osiris, who is the, the uh, personification of farming, which is why he's green and black, dealing with vegetation and the, and the soil, et cetera, et cetera. And so those traditions traveled, those blacksmiths traveled, and you get this Ogun tradition in Yoruba land and all this other kind of stuff. So you can always tell as I mentioned in the last one, like when uh, when the oral traditions that were recorded for the migrations of from Egypt coming from North Africa into West Africa into Senegal, they brought with them words and technologies dealing with metallurgy. And so in, in the Egyptian, they have jis, knife, njis, knife, wolof, jasi, blade, dagger, hatchet, das, to sharpen. Middle Egyptian, gem to pierce, to penetrate, wolof, jam, to stab, puncture. Middle Egyptian, gem, worm, jiji, a sacred snake, wolof, jan, snake. When they came to, um, and they say this in their oral tradition, when the first wave of, of people from Egypt came into Senegal, they brought with them metal tools. And this, these words were borrowed into wolof. And so it's the same thing when you get into places like Nigeria. 
So nam, Middle Egyptian, knife for butchering. Ebo, nama, ma, knife. In amongst the Yoruba, obe, knife. And then you had this word, mineral for meteoric origin, oral metal, copper. And then this word is used, you know, bi in pet, iron. Oh, boy, brand, branding iron. And so these, you can tell the direction of the barrings because this metallurgy, these camps, they traveled across Africa and, and people got initiated into those guilds and brought those things back into different areas. This is part of the trade. And so we continue to, uh, uh, you know, along with the Yoruba. And so remember what I said last week, not last week, the, the, the week before last, in part one of this presentation, in that <laughs> our, when we, was, when we was having these conversations with Brother Unk and Brother... Uh, Chief X and uh, Brother uh, Garfield, etc. They they were talking about we need to see, you know, uh, DNA studies and all this other kind of stuff. And I'm like, DNA is not going to help you at this stage of the argument in terms of proving migrations. And the reason why I said that is because there's not many excavations and and uh, and like equivalent to mummies or, or, or samples that you can extract DNA from ancient time periods. So you would need them for like 5,000 years ago, 10,000 years ago, 20,000 years ago. And that doesn't exist in large numbers uh, in West Africa because of the, in, the physical environment and how the physical environment eats away at bones and, and flesh and stuff. It's not like the desert where certain things can be preserved for thousands of thousands of years. And so only in certain circumstances is that the case in West Africa. And so not you have that, and then you have the fact that there just hasn't been that many excavations uh, concerning you know, this thing. And so one of the things that I stated was that you, you also, you, you need those foundational uh, bones because or you know or or flesh samples in order to have a base comparison to see if the the people that lived there are the same people who lived in modern times without it you don't have an argument there's nothing to discuss just because you have uh e1 b1a in in west africa you know, saying now doesn't mean that that haplogroup was there 20,000 years ago or 10,000 years ago. And so populations replace each other all the time. Populations migrate for various reasons. Populations die out and are replaced. So you have all throughout history where whole populations have died of diseases and things, have died because of volcanic explosions. And, and things of this nature, gas things, and then over their graves, later on, people have settled in those communities that did not originate there. So if you're a scholar, you know these things, and which is why we just don't jump out of the window feet first or head first, you know, with allegations and claims. You know, and so in this, and what I have uh, up here is an example of what I mean. So this is from an article in Nature that just came out January 2020. It's ancient West African foragers in the context of African population history. Now, this is from the uh, abstract. It says, our knowledge of ancient human population structure in sub-Saharan Africa, particularly prior to the advent of food production, remains limited. Here we report genome-wide DNA data from four children, two of whom were buried approximately 8,000 years ago, that means 6,000 BC, and two 3,000 years ago, that means 1,000 BC, from Shum Laka in Cameroon, one of the earliest known archaeological sites within the probable homeland of the Bantu language group. 
One individual carried the deeply divergent Y chromosome haplogroup A00, which today is found almost exclusively in the same region. However, the genome-wide ancestry profiles of all four individuals are most similar to those of present-day hunter-gatherers from the Western Central Africa, which implies that populations in Western Cameroon today, as well as speakers of Bantu languages from across the continent, are not. I have this highlighted in red and with some stars, so you can see the word not descended substantially from the population represented by these four people. We infer an Africa-wide phylogeny that features widespread admixture at three prominent radiations, including one that gave rise to at least four major lineages deep in the history of modern humans. So what it's saying here, based on this data, that, that if we are to take as representative, it's not a representative sample, but it, it gives you some idea, and, it, and it's good here because these are two different time depths. So we have one 8,000 years ago, and we and two samples from 8,000 years ago, and then we have DNA samples, two DNA samples from um, 3,000 years ago. So this is a, a great time span. So we know that the, the people in this area from 8,000 years ago to 3,000 years ago are the same people. So they've been living there that long. And so what they're saying is that the, the modern Bantu people who in this area, because remember, this is supposed to be allegedly where Bantu starts in Cameroon, in, in, in this very area here, that they come later, that they're not, they don't originally, they haven't been living there. These folks have not been living there no 10,000, you know, years and all this other kind of stuff. So these people totally, these people who were in modern Cameroon, for the most part, virtually replaced the indigenous folks that lived there. And so, hold on. And so these individuals who they're talking about, these hunter-gatherers, are your Batwa people. Keep that in mind. These, these so-called hunter-gatherers, these are Batwa folks. So let's go to the African origin of civilization. By the great ancestor Shekhanta Joe or Shekhanta Dia. When he's talking about his chapter on migrations, what is that? Page 179 of the text. He's talking about migrations here. And he says, from what we know about archaeology of South Africa, where humanity seems to have been born, from what we know about Nubian civilization, probably the oldest of all, from what we know about the prehistory of the Nile Valley. We can legitimately assume that the great water, because he's talking about in their stories that they are, you always find that they come from the great waters. Remember we read that earlier um, from uh, Arme uh, uh, Kwa. Uh, when he was talking about in Ghana, they had these things that did come from the great water. Is none other than a now. No matter where we collect legends on the genesis of Black African people, those who still remember their origin say they came from the East and that their forebearers found pygmies. Batwa, found in Yoruba Legends report, and he has, um, matter of fact, let me just read quick because I have the book in my hand. So let's go to one page 179. Let's go back. So what chapter is this on page? So it's chapter nine, is it? Y'all roll with me. Is there something else I want to read here? Oh, I skipped the page. So this is chapter nine. So uh yeah, so 179. So the first one, he has a and what I'm highlighting here is he has a footnote, but he doesn't have footnotes, he has in notes. So you got to go all the way to the back of the book. So chapter nine, he talks about uh, first one, <laughs> the word kondong, kondrong, a dwarf inhabiting the forest with a good luck utensil on his head, suggests the memory of cohabitation with the pygmy in a forest area before the installation of the wolof on the plains of Kerbao, um, where there are neither forests nor pygmies. 
hold on. Uh, this is Brother Ben calling me. I guess he don't know I got a show going on. Let me decline the call real quick. Uh, boom. Okay. Anyway. <clears throat> hold on. Uh, uh, okay. So, yeah. So, what he's talking about here is that, you know, even amongst the wool off, they still have the stories of meeting the Batwa, the pygmies in West Africa. And so what people don't realize is that West Africa was dominated by um, your Khoi type people and your Batwa type people. And that these tall Africans, these these uh, taller black Africans come from the east. They come from the Sudan. And so you, when you read Diop's works, he, he, he talks about this. And we have greater evidence today to support his initial um, uh, theories and hypotheses. And so continue, he says, Dogon and Yoruba legends report that they came from the east, while those of the Fong, who as recently as the 19th century had not yet reached the Atlantic coast, indicate the northeast. Bakuba legends list the north as their province. For peoples living south of the Nile, tradition suggests that they came from the north. This is true of the Batutsi of Rwanda, Urundi, when the first sailors to reach South Africa disembarked at the Cape several uh, centuries ago, the Zulu, after a north-south migration, had not yet reached the tip of the Cape. So he's talking about all these different migrations. There's various reasons. And you got to read um, Chancellor Williams' the Destruction of Black Civilization. He does an excellent job explaining the reasons for these migrations and ultimately the weakness of Africa, which led to the slave trade. That's another subject. But I just want to keep this in mind. I have this highlighted here. He says, no matter where we collect these legends on the genesis of black African people, those who still remember their origins say they came from the east and that their forebearers found pygmies in the country. So remember last week when I brought this out, I'm the first one who to make these connections. You will see people biting my work and not giving me credit, but it is what it is. So this is a a uh representation of Bess coming into uh uh, uh West Africa uh and found in Ile Ife and which was dated between 1000 and 1500 AD. There is no Egyptology at this point. There are no Arabs and Christians coming in and saying the greatness of Egypt and 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 putting in their heads that they should you know there's no photographs so they weren't bringing no statues they weren't bringing no papyri you know into west africa in, uh in in this period uh in terms these are this is from the the minds of the people who have already been dealing in trade since the pharaonic period and so these pygmies for those of us who study Egypt, know that they came into the forest zones to find these Batwa pygmies. And so we can tell when we look at the art here that these are the same because they're all wearing the same ancestral Igungun skulls here. And so this isn't a full body representation of this one because it, it's, it's been broken into pieces. Uh, as a result of, you know, saying living in this environment, but you see the, the same representations. And so this is in the Levure, uh Museum in Paris. And this is, uh, I forgot where this is housed now, but I think it's still in Nigeria. And so Henry Jewell, a well-known um, anthropologist and historian, uh, took this photo. And so you can see in Benin, the court dwarfs here, same loop around the belly that you find with Bess, um, a different kind of representation in the face, but still the big list, but also the skull pendant. And so this is a common tradition here. And again, a pygmy figure in Cameroon. This is a stool from Cameroon. Why would this be important? Benin, Cameroon, Nigeria. That's where these folks lived prior to 
the, the, the pygmies dominated. So when these folks, these tall Africans came from the Sudan and, and, and in Chad and stuff further west, these are the people that they encountered. So they play a prominent role in their mythology. You know, even though Batala is associated with uh, a Batwa pygmy, so to speak. So this is why, you know, like with the evidence that we've seen so far, this is why people like Graham Kona in his text, Nigerian Prehistory and Archaeology, makes the note that it does seem that at least in part, the Yoruba did have some sort of Sudanic origin and were not originally all forest zone dwellers. Thus, the modern Yoruba are very likely a composite product resulting from the intermixing of people already in the forest with others emanating from the Susanic zone. And so this is usually for, for people who claim uh, a Sudanic and Nile Valley origin, that they're not saying that everyone comes necessarily from ancient Kemet into these areas. It's just that those folks migrated and settled amongst people who were there first, because you have people who migrated from the Sahara and settled into these areas. And then the later uh, Egyptians and Sudanese folks who, who migrated further west met their cousins who migrated from the Sahara, who were the first people to interact with the Batwa and the Khoisan who were in those west uh, and central Af African areas. So that's why I said the 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 history of Africa is complex. And so here is one of those oral traditions, for example, of some of those folks who came out of the Sahara. This is from um, a text, Baba Babutidi in Bantu Migration and Settlement in Le Mans Congo Cultural Collection. And this is exists on microfilm. This is from 1914. And I think it was originally recorded like in 1911, 1912. It was just published in 1914. And so in this text, it says, it's talking about the, the Bakongo, Kikongo speakers. It says, a long time ago in antiquity, people did not exist in this lower Congo. They came from the north of the country. There also in north, in the north, people came from far off north, the very north of Kayinga. Kayinga is the name of the country where or region where lived our ancestors in antiquity. There they already knew how to weave the cloths they wore, forge hoses and knives that they used. The main reason for their coming into this country or area was the famine that hit Kayinga. For many years, the drought rained. Crops and fruit trees they planted dried up. They suffered a lot for this. Unable to support the suffering, they said to each other, let's go to Banda and Putu. Let's pass through the dense forest, the unbreakable wall, and organize chieftaincies because we have a lot of hunger up here. So they agreed, let's go. And so what you see here is that due to a famine, or whatnot, a large scale famine for a long for a time, they decided to move whole scale. And so, as I mentioned before, this 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 supports Chancellor Williams, and he's talking about all the different migrations because of the environments that the Africans were living in were harsh. And people were dying and they couldn't survive in those areas. So once large groups begin to scatter and break up and migrate to different parts of the continent. Hold on one sec. Um, oop, no. There we go. Uh, is there anything going on in the chat? Nothing going on in the chat. Uh, oops. Let me refresh. Okay, boom. So, <clears throat> so when people talk about whole scale, people don't move and things of this nature. That is incorrect. And there's many different reasons why people move. And food, the 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 search for food is one of the main ones but also because of diseases and war so matter of fact when you when you get aluja volume 2 in the introduction i have uh some scholarship and testimony talking about 
how because I'm dealing with the different migrations. We're talking about this in Guni tribes who moved from South Africa into Malawi. This is 1500 miles trying to leave uh, South Africa because of the, the Shaka Zulu invasions. So when Tashaka Zulu was going around um, killing folks and taking over villages and things of that nature, they migrated. Their whole community, whole village migrated 1,500 miles into Malawi. And so I give I give some representative numbers and what that would mean when people you know migrate in terms of um, uh, Egypt and things of that nature for that same distance. And so I heard Brother Chief X talking about when people conquer, you know, saying your territory that, you know, people don't move, that they just sit there. That's that's some BS. We we have um, um, documents all around a whole communities moving. Long distances to get away from war and being conquered, not only from Europeans and Arabs, but from other Africans. And and I and I and I give one example here. Uh, in the text. So you can, that conversation starts on page uh, 32 and goes on to page 35. So, <laughs> so we'll continue. So again, this Kayinga is what is the, what is now known as the Sahara. And so they're using a word that you find in the Nile Valley. So this word, Yenit, a Kinet is a desert valley. In Proto Bantu is Jika, Nika, grassland desert. And so Kikongo, they say Ka Yinga. The Ka is a prefix of place. Just like this T, this Ka is Egyptian T, which is suffixed. So Ka Yinga, Ta Yinga. And, and all throughout um, Aluja Volume 2, you will see that I make the, the correspondences between Bantu, the nasalized. Uh, Valar, this N here with Egyptian N. So we, uh, you know, these are these are the things. So now that was the oral tradition. So you remember I talked about those methods. There's certain things that you have to understand in terms of of research methodology and being able to read in terms of archaeology and paleo. Uh, anthropology, etc., that helps to support these things. So, just like how in Diop's testimony, the the original people in those areas were pygmies, and then we have the DNA study that showed that in this area that these these Bantu people met pygmies, these these hunter gatherer pygmies, these Batwa folks. That's what the um, the the DNA test. Uh, match and so the 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 saying that the people who were in the Cameroon area uh, allegedly where these Bantu started they did not exist there in these regions that it was dominated by these hunter gatherer folks and so now we have this testimony of of the of the Bantu people that's recorded in in uh, 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 1911 1912 but published in 1914 saying that we come from Kayinga the desert there's no deserts in Nigeria. There's no deserts in Cameroon. This is what they're saying here. This is the Sahara. So now let's go into some um let's go into some 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 good old modern scholarship on this issue. So we have uh Dr. Cohen Bosin et al. Uh the text middle to late Holocene paleoclimatic change and the early Bantu expansion in the rainforests of West Central Africa. They discuss how the late Holocene paleoclimatic change may have been the motivating factor for the acclaimed Bantu expansion. <laughs> so, as I, I, I cite this in the Luge Volume 2, and so, um, but I'm citing this, this paper here that came out in 2015. <laughs> It says, what is especially interesting, uh, oh, excuse me, this is what I say in, in, in um, volume two. So what is especially interesting of this article in relation to the Congo oral tradition cited by Fukuyao, which we just read, 
can be summed up in the following paragraph of Dr. Bolson et al. In the archaeological section of the article, the authors note that around 7,000 to 6,000 um, BP, that's 5,000 to 4,000 BCE, an archaeological site in Cameroon bears first marks of ceramic late stone age, of the ceramic late stone age. The bifacial macrolith and polished stone tools with a few decorated potsherds at around 5,000 to 4,000 um, before present. This macrolithic industry had become predominant over pre-existing microlithic industries and reached a point of completion. However, during the same period, a new type of pottery appears. So there's some folks there that existed um, or, uh, in the area, and then um, some new folks came in, which brings in a new tradition. And so now we go to page 10 of the text, which we was talking about. It says, small immigrant communities from farther north settling into the grass fields zones due to a serious climatic deterioration around 7,100 to 6,900 BP in the Sahara and the Sahel have been held responsible for the slow introduction of these new technologies, the technologies which we just talked about right now. The increased use of macroliths from 5,000 to 4,000 BP onward reflects a shift in the technical requirements of the shelter's occupants. Especially noteworthy is the respect in the emergence of partially polished tools of the axe and hole type. So remember, he said, let's go, <laughs> let's go back to the oral tradition here. Um, he said, you know, they already knew how to weave the cloths. They wore forged holes and knives that they used. The main reason for that coming into this, so they, they use holes and knives. They, they already knew all this stuff, and so they bring this with them from the Sahara into the Congo region. So now we read, we read here, remember that it was a totally different industry that came in during this, this period, during the, the, the drying and expansion of the Sahara. So they say in this text here, especially noteworthy is this respect is the emergence of partially polished tools of the axe hole type that that's coming with this new industry of people coming in um, because of pressures in the Sahara. So they continue. Bantu's closest external relatives of the Benu Congo family are spoken in the northern Cameroon, Nigeria, and Benin. Linguists have situated their homeland in the Niger-Benu confluence area of Nigeria. Likewise, archaeologists have held immigrants from further north responsible for the slow introduction of technologies characteristic of the ceramic late stone age into the grass fields. Eridification striking the Sahara and the Sahel around 7000 BP may have driven them further southward. So this, this evidence, this paleoclimatic evidence showing and demonstrating that it is the drying of the Sahara that pushed these individuals through Nigeria into Cameroon and further south. And so you have the oral tradition that still had this in memory about us living in Kayinga, the desert area. The, the, they're on the borders of the desert in the Sahel. And because of the, the famines, the great famines, because of the expansion of the Sahara, it pushed them south. And so this goes into greatly what I talk about in Illusion Volume 2 and how the Bantu, quote unquote, doesn't start in Nigeria and Cameroon. They start in the Great Lakes region and the Bantu migrate into the Sahara. When the Sahara starts drying, some of the Bantu migrate into um, Nigeria and, um, and into Cameroon. Another group remain well another group remains in the sudan these are your gabaya you know saying folks and things some of these migrants go into the nile valley into ancient egypt and further into the levant and they help to formulate in that convergence process what we call proto-semitic and all of this because of the drying of the sahara then you have these sudanic back migrations into or not necessarily back migrations but later on during the later part of Egyptian history and, and during its fall, um, after the during and after the Marotic period, you have people migrating into West Africa. 
So it's a complex cycle of things, and it's not just one event in history. And so this is, um, <laughs> hold on, uh, this is, you know, saying the, the evidence that you got to put together when we having these concepts. So now we're going into the last part of our conversation, and that is West Africa and the concept of nature. And so, you know, for all of y'all who want to talk about West Africa, we ain't got nothing to do with Egypt and y'all dealing with the natures and the gods and all this other kind of stuff, you're going to be dealing with them in West Africa too. You can't escape the nature route. And so this is one of the symbols for nature in Chikam, you know, the word I use after Mubai Benge Belolo for uh, Egyptian. And it is defined as God. And I have no problem using the word God. In the upcoming publication, I'm going to demonstrate that the very word G-O-D is cognate. It is a dialectical variation of the word nature. They're the same word. Well, we'll get into that at another time. I have a whole presentation for you. But here's the symbol for nature in um, Egyptian with the determinative of a seated man. This is also nature. So a nature, and see, this is what people got to understand. People who don't believe in, in gods, they don't understand what a god is in African uh, context. So you can have a god in terms of a spirit, and then you have gods, human beings. So to act like you don't, to say that you don't believe in gods and that you're atheist is to argue that human beings don't exist. And so it's, it's really quite silly. Um, but, you know, we'll, we'll deal with that at a later time. So uh, the Complete Gods and Goddesses text by uh, Dr. Richard Wilson, he, he states in the text that uh, he notes that in, in by examining the word's use in terms of the word nature in Egyptian text, it is clear that it actually encompasses a far wider range of meanings than the English word God, as we understand it. The category nature could include deified humans, famous individuals, and from the 30th dynasty onward, those who drowned, as well as benevolent and malevolent spirits. So when you talk about a nature, Snoop Doggy Dog is a nature. He's famous. You can't escape the natural. It's, it's just somebody who is very skilled at what they do. Like Baba Heru is a nature because his craftsmanship is unmatched in the community. He is a god. He is a nature. That is a living nature, a flesh and blood nature. Then you have natures that apply to spirits, as it says. And in deified folks, deified humans. And so when people try to have these arguments, but then claim in West Africa and stuff like this, they need to they need to hold off um, on on a lot of these 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 objections that they have, because everyone who claims that there's no connection between West Africa and ancient Kim and not one of them actually studies West Africa. None of them actually studies and is a part of any traditions that deal with West Africa. So they don't know. They just talk. And so this is what we're here to clear up. And so here's the word netter in a number of uh, African languages. So in Coptic, they say nute. In Sango, they say toro which is spirit or phantom, in the Zande language. This is all Central Africa here, Toro. But in a tree, in a kind, they say Intoro, spirit of the patrilineage. lineage. In Ewe, Trowo, guardian spirit. In Wolof, Tor, protector God. So if you go to Senegal, you got Neches. If you go to Ghana, you got Neches. If you go to Central Africa, you got Neches. If you go to ancient Egypt, you got Neches. It's Neches everywhere. Can't escape the Netches. The Netches is all in your face.
So I will calm down and continue. This is some of the earliest symbolisms of the word nature in the hieroglyphs. Version A over here is a, a stick or a pole wrapped in a cloth. B is some kind of stylized variant of it. It's really just kind of two strings of cloth. And the earliest uh, version of the word nature can be seen in this pole, and it has three strings. And so it, it's strips of cloth on the pole, you know, or on a stick. And so what you see later in Egyptian is a stylized variant but this on the right hand side is the earliest representation of the nature symbol and so we can see it on these early pot marks here so you see here it has two strips of cloth here's one that has three and so this this phrase here is hes nature the god is praised or the god be praised this is pre-dynastic here and then we have Abet Netcher, the lunar festival of God, and this early pottery here. And you, so you can see the word, you can see it actually have kind of a base at the bottom. So notice this, you have the tall strip, look how long the, the, the strips of cloth are. And you have this, this piece of land right here. So... Um, it's a the word nature besides God and spirit is a word <laughs> that means garment and material. And so you can see it in this word here, nature, garment, material. And this word saha, nature, which is linen, and this word sa is deceased, nobility, bind with bandages, mummy. So this is a mummy's linen. And so that's why you see in this representation the mummy wrappings around the nature symbol. And so we find this word, uh, uh, this part in the word, in the Yoruba word, tala, muslim, calico, white cloth. And there's a word, ala, meaning white in the Yoruba language. And so for those of you who, you know, uh, worship and recognize obatala, the folk etymology of Obatala is king of the white cloth. Oba meaning clean, king, and Tala meaning cloth. But that's not what the word means. But because the, they have a word Tala meaning cloth, and uh, which is a, just happens to be a white cloth, and they have the word Ala white, this is why Obatala is the king of the white cloth. Because remember, um, Paranimi is the order of the day in Africa. And so Obatala, it actually means the exalted king because they have a word Tala and the tone marks will tell you Tala versus, you know, any other version of Tala. But this word, the Yoruba deity Obatala is exalted king. That's what this name means. But it's still a word that is cognate with a variation of the word netter. So in Kikongo, intela, the measure of extent of height, height, stature, tallness, size. It has to do with bigness. In collagen, toro, the sky, the on high, the heavens. God, toro, elevate, toror, massive and high, elevated. Netoror, the exalted, the almighty one. Kikongo, Netelo, a little portion added to what is bargained for. Make weight. Intotela, emperor, the title of kings of Congo. Intulu, size, height of a quadruped. And so that word Tala is uh, cognate with Hebrew Talul, exalted, lawfully. Arabic, Taala. Exalted is he, tali, high, tall. And so if you think you're going to go into Yoruba land and escape ancient Egypt and its concepts, you are mistaken because they worship nature too. Obatala, 
the exalted king. And so here is, this is a computer rendition because uh, since the fall of Egypt, the actual nature poles have, you know, been destroyed and, and taken down. So this is a computer rendition based off of facts that we know um, concerning the, the temples and things. So you will find these nature poles with these strips of cloth on the side of them on in the front of temples and this is just a representation of that so now we're going to talk about nature among the yoruba <laughs> as i state in eluja volume two the combination of a piece of cloth and a pole to represent an aspect of spirit of the spirit world is pretty widespread in traditional africa an example can be seen in Nigeria and Benin among the Yoruba, Igbo, and the Fon, respectively. As it regards the medicine men, the diviners, the Awo, who travel to do consultations in the villages and who advertise by a distinctive mark. So this is what I say in Eluja Volume 2. Now we're going to get into some citations because, you know, uh, you know, it's, 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 it's source up or shut up where we come from so anyway so in this text here uh i, I mentioned the text uh, the religion of west africa in agdi 1983 in the article here it talks about it says it, it's talking about the babalawos so the babalawos they were pastors advisors, advisors consultants they hardly preached Excuse me. The closest to their function in the work of the ministers of the church is in pastoral counseling in one to one confidential situations. So this will be familiar for anyone who has ever had a reading from a Babalawo. They the, you you consult the Babalawo, you know, concerning, you know, private matters, big decisions that you have to make, etc. And yet from the base of privacy of Awo, uh, the word Awo means secret. Their reputation was noised abroad by word of mouth. So that's that's how people got to be known um, by their, you know, their work, by word of mouth. And worried people traveled to consult them over their dwellings. This is how you knew that you was by a, a Babalawo's house or that a Babalawo was visiting. Over their dwellings, they hoisted a white cloth on a pole. That white cloth in the Babalawos is the Babalawo symbolic way of announcing, here you may ask of God. And wherever in Yoruba land, in Igbo land, or in Dahomey, one sees that white cloth fluttering atop a pole, one knows wordlessly that there dwells a wise man, a medicine man, perhaps also a magician, invariably a man of God. A nature. Tala, they put the tala on the pole, the cloth, and they're letting you know that a priest is present. And, and through the priest, as the master of Awo, as the master of Odu, consults with God, the ancestors and spirits, and y'all work out y'all problems this way. So, and I, and I have this word up here, in Kela, which is an erudite, learned man, educated, civilized, and noble. This is Chiluba. But this is a variation, the more archaic word, nature. So when we're talking about um, this is a man of God, a master of what they're crafting, what they do, it's in Kela and Chiluba, nature in Egyptian. And they say Baba, Baba Lawo, Awo, um, a different word, but this is this is their equivalent in terms of the title. But you can see that they hoist the stick with the white cloth in that area. So we have uh, another one, another citation. This is a different article. <laughs> this is the Osagbaye among the Benin. At the worship of, of Osuk Baye, which is the one rare, clear instance of the worship of the Supreme Being, I have highlighted in red, 
a pole is dug into the ground with sand piled up around it. By it is placed a coconut rub with a mixture of orhue or horhue, which is a white chalk, and a separate piece of orhue. A white piece of cloth is tied to the top of the pole. It is not only to the supreme god that uh, the orhue is offered. Orhue is offered to all deities that is used in ritual worship to Urha, the ancestors. And so you see this combination here of um, in, in these areas where, where there's any kind of consultation, any kind of conversation with the ancestors, the spirits, or God, they plant this tree, they plant this stick, and they tie these um, characters, these strips of cloth on the top of it, representing the natures. Because the strips of cloth, we'll get into what that symbolizes, but when the wind hits the cloth, it is symbolic of the spirit moving in the place to be. And so no matter where you go, you not escaping ancient Egyptian concepts and the Neturu. There's a reason why these African Americans are so attracted to ancient Kemet and the ancient Sudan and Mero, et cetera, et cetera. Because where they come from in their ancestral memory, they are seeing the same things. And so it is your ancestors calling you back to your traditions and the origin of all these things. But I'm going to keep it moving because we ain't done yet. So Robert Ferris Thompson, in his publication, Face of the Gods, the Artists and Their Altars, talks about the Suriname in South America, uh, in Juca and Samaca talks about these flags that um, are used for altars. Flags honor heroic ancestors who heard the, excuse me, who heard the guns of war, who successfully fought for liberation from plantation slavery in the 18th century. So these, this concept of putting cloth on poles to represent ancestors and, and spirit and the divine was brought overseas by these Africans. And so this is in South America. It was also brought to Haiti. The Congo used flags to spiritually. So remember, this was, we, we talked about the, the, the flag. So remember in Voodoo, um, this is where you would see these poles and flags, these netchers. In Voodoo, you find them in the Yoruba Ifa tradition, and now he's talking about this in the Congo. So the Congo used these flags to spiritually capture the wind. Their word for flag also carries meanings of wind and spirit. A banner waving in the breeze that represents an honored ancestor. And so this stuff was brought also into the United States. They brought the Netchers over here into the Caribbean. And so all of my voodoo practitioners out in Haiti who still keep this tradition alive are honoring the, the Netcheru, the ancestors, those revered ancestors. And so where my family is from, and our funerary rites, we still carry the tradition of the Neturu because we still have those strings of cloth. Now we just transferred it to umbrellas. And if you have not been to a New Orleans funeral, so remember that a lot of folks that come from New Orleans, they have roots in Haiti. And so there's a reason why they call it Congo Square in New Orleans. We brought these traditions and we modified them. So when we go to our funerals and we honor our dead, we put these strings, we put these cloths on our umbrellas and we do the second line. 
and we march honoring the ones who just died. I'm going to continue. And so we even see the Netchers in the Black Panthers movie. Even though this is the video, this is Kendrick Lamar's video. And you see at the end of that famous video that he got when the Black Panther movie came out, that when he was walking up to those four beautiful, black, Nubian, shiny skinned goddesses at the end, you see these flags planted in the waters of the Nun. It's our tradition. But we ain't done yet. We're going to go back to Ghana. I'm going, going back, back to Ghana, Ghana. <laughs> Our good brother Chief X posted about the Adinkra symbols. And we all know these famous Adinkra symbols. We have a coma over here, this heart symbol. Dealing with love and all this other kind of stuff. We got, we know the famous St. Kofa symbol to go back and fetch it. There's a plethora of these symbols. Now, when people talk about a dinkra, really a dinkra is a cloth with the designs. And for example, this, this adinkra that I have uh, isolated over here on the right, it says, Aseseya Duru, the earth has weight. This symbol represents the importance of the earth in sustaining life. It is a symbol of the providence and the divinity of Mother Earth. So these symbols have proverbs associated with it. They have teachings. So they just aren't just, just fancy little symbols that are good for tattoos. These are wisdom traditions embodied in the symbol. symbol. These are uh, Akan, Ashanti hieroglyphs. And so you see when you go to Ghana, these cloths with the Adinkra symbols. Everywhere. You see it everywhere when you're in Ghana. <laughs> so this is just a, a sidebar for the moment. And so I did a lecture at the Shekanta Diop conference a few years ago introducing this project that will be coming starting at the end of this year. And that is the African-American Adinkra Project. And we're going to be gathering some folks and we're going to design our own symbols. And so I have named these symbols Busongi. It's a Chiluba Bantu word uh, from the word Songa, meaning to excite, to stimulate, to provoke. A derivative is Lusonge, excitation, instigation. Any variant is songa. Uh, uh, it's a different word, but the same meaning. So we're using paronymy here. To cut to a point, pruning, sharpening, sculpture. To make a sculpture, carving. So busongi is sculpture, writings. But writings that are, are meant to excite, to provoke thought in the mind. So African Americans will have their own symbols soon. Called busongi. <clears throat> And we will put this on all kinds of material and our own rituals and ceremonies and things of that nature. So continuing in the ancestors, we're doing an eluja, not only retracing our steps and recovering, but building on restoring that which had been broken and, and, and stolen, but, it, it, but improving upon ideas. So we're taking the essence of these studies and we're creating our own here. So our quote unquote adinkras will be called busongi and so just a plug just a preview 
in this moment. So getting back to Adinkra, Yaba Amgubarale Ble, and I totally messed this man's name up, but you know, until I hear it said, I, I don't know how to say it. So anyway, in this text in the Encyclopedia of African Religion, on the entry under Adinkra, and, and a shameless and a unshameless plug here, I have two entries in this text in the Encyclopedia of African Religion. I have one on Osiris and I have one on secret societies. So I have two entries in this book. So if you ever get this book, read it because it has a lot of valuable information. So anyway, so the Adinkra symbols associated most often with a multitude of symbols. The term Adinkra is more accurately used to denote a symbolic funerary message given to transitioning or departed souls. The term G means to make use of or to employ, and the term Inkra means message. Literally, the Adinkra means to make use of a message, but when spoken together, the term is understood to mean to leave one another to say goodbye. Moreover, because the term Inkra has kra, life force or soul, it at its roots, Adinkra is further understood as a message that a transitioning and or departed soul takes with it on its return to Inyame. So this is their living tradition, the same way to how you have pyramid texts, how you have these messages that are sent on the walls and in papyri and put into the coffins of the deceased, into the tombs of the deceased. They do this in, in Ghana, but they use it using their own hieroglyphs, the Adink cross. And these symbols are used in, for, they were initially used in funerary, at funerals for departed persons and especially kings. So for all of you non-God, uh, uh, spirit-believing folks, but you want to wear a Dinkra symbols, you out of pocket because you can't separate the religion in the, uh, from the culture in Africa. The culture is the religion. And so thus, Adinkra is a type of language. So they put these on cloths, and we'll get into that. And so from another source, while Adinkra symbols have been adapted to be used in everyday life on all kinds of objects, they were used in considerably more limited and reverent ways as ceremonial clothing pieces. So the okra, soul, the spirit, interwoven into the cloths. Traditionally, Ashanti royalty spiritual leaders and other elites were adinkra cloth to special occasions, including to funerals, as a way to honor the deceased. The adinkra cloth chosen to be worn to funerals could represent traits the deceased had, evoke sentiments and messages to the deceased, or both. So they communicate with the deceased using these spiritual cloths called adinkra. And we're going to see why the word Adinkra is important and its connection to the word Netcher. Only spiritual leaders and royals were able to enjoy this luxury where a special process was used to handcraft these one-of-a-kind cloths. So just like how we saw in Yoruba land, just how we saw in Benin, just how we saw in Congo and in Haiti and in South America, in Ghana, they have these special cloths to communicate with the spirit, communicate with the dead. And we call these cloths a dinkra. And then subsequently, we call the signs a dinkra. So let's go back to ancient Kemet real quick. So that word ka or kra, remember this is the nasalized Vular trio, this symbol here. It it 
comes from the same root. And I discussed this in Eluja Volume 2. You get all the goods in Eluja Volume 2 because I love you all. And y'all treat me well, so I'm going to treat y'all well with good, solid information. And I'll let you know how all of this works out to where you can prove it and you can argue with folks with it. But this word ka or kra comes from a common root, which is the R here. And in one direction, it means to be powerful. And from this is where we get the word for spirit and to also do work and even the word for bull. And then on the other hand, you have the word to say and then name and personality. And then another word for spirit or soul, I should say. And so this is okra, as we already discussed in this and in, um, in the previous slides. And so that word kra or nature in Chiluba, the word nature God is inkole inquele, God, bainkole spirits, ghost. Nature fixed, set, solid, firm, hard. That's why it's the word for the pole and the handle. From this word, kale, strong, well, vigorous, arduous, firm, steady, stable, solid, hard, and movable, fixed, steadfast, powerful, robust, tough as meat. It is from this root here that you get the word God. Ikala, to be, to stay, to remain. Nature, divine, sacred. Bukale, sacred. Nature, priest of Ra. Nechiriru. Marquidi, priest. From the word Aquila, advocate for, defend, rule over, govern. Nature, power, divinity. Nature, Terry, divine, strong. Bukole, strength, energy, express. Hold on. <laughs> Nature, natron, soda, trona, sodium, bicarbonate, carbonate. Mukele, salt. So you know that natron is a salt in the sea. So we demonstrate here that the word nature in Egyptian corresponds with Nkole, Nkwele, God, and Chiluba. The KL consonant sequence is the original. The ch is the palatalized variant of this word. So Chiluba Bantu keeps the more archaic pronunciation. And so does uh, the uh, country and the word kra, while they also have the word in toro, which is a variant which also may, to some extent, may be a bar or just a dialectical variant in the language. So in Egyptian, the word nature is not only represented by that actual uh, stick and cloth, because there's a word nature meaning pole and stick, and there's a word nature meaning cloth. And so you see that both represented in a sign. But this word, this glyph here is nature. So is this word here, excuse me, this sign here, nature, the hawk. And then the hawk on the standard is also nature. So the word nature and the word heru are also the same word. Just dialectical variations. There's four or five variations of the word nature in the Egyptian language, which tells us that there are different multiple clans who spoke different languages, who contributed their words into the lexicon of old, old kingdom, Middle Egyptian, um, the language family. But Heru is all that is, is the word nature. And so we have Nkole, Ngole. Remember that I said the word nature applies to God and human beings. And so this word in Chiluba, in Kole, in Kola, in Gole, in Gola, is eminent or powerful man. I dare one of y'all to say that there are no eminent or powerful men on this earth. All you atheists who swear that the gods don't exist. And so... On this, we have to agree with our brothers in the nation of Islam that says the black man is God. But technically, according to this, any man is God who, you know, but that's neither here nor there. But anyway, the black man is God. And so in college, we have Nkolo, 
which I think is a borrowing. But in King Congo, they say inkweye, inkweya, go spirit. But it comes from this proto Bantu root code to become strong. And then you have Cody Hawk. This is the hawk that you see in ancient Kemet, which becomes Heru. But it's Kiri, a type of hawk in collagen, and Intala, or Intala, male bird in Chiluba. And then Mukulu, chief, director, president, head. Inkela, erudite, learned man, educated, civilized, and noble. A priest is Inkela. A chief, the head, the state, the pharaoh in Kulu, Mu in Kulu. In Kole and Gole, an eminent and powerful man. And so we continue. So as I, as I demonstrate in the book, that the root comes from Ila, to make, leave, or exit from oneself, a sound, an idea, a speech, or an object to emit, to express, to speak, to introduce, put, set, make, push. Dispose, arrange, lay, apply, put out, blade, to put out into place. The, the equivalent is the R in to separate two towards in Shikam. So you have Ila to speak, R, mouth to speak, Ilela, make a to do, Akula, talk, utter, express. You have Iri to do, to make, Iri to recite. Oh, excuse me. The, let me, let me, uh, the 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 words are going down like this. So in this lane, you have ila to make, um, to do, and then from there you have bukole energy spirit, and then inkole God a powerful man, and so you have on, on this branch ila to speak, and then you have akula to talk to express to utter. Then you have over here iri to do to make, um, and then the word for spirit, and then ultimately the word for God. And then here, mouth, speak, iri to recite, kara to say, and then churi to complain is the variant here. And so what I show is that there's a, there's a systematic way in which the word nature is built and that the word ka, spirit, soul, and the word nature are the same word. These are from two different dialects or languages in the Egyptian language. And this word iri, to do, to make, iri, to cite, also to create, an iru is a maker, a creator. It's the same word, all three of these. And so it is from this word here, iri, to do, to make, that we get the word Allah from in Arabic. Allah, proto-Semitic El, is a borrowing from Egyptian. That's going to be a whole different lecture. You know I got that homework. So we'll continue. And so um, this terms here. Uh, this is from another lecture, but dealing with and showing how the words for uh, ancestors and spirit correlate for words for river and lake as well uh, in these languages. And so when you say Olokun, the owner of the sea, it's within that tradition in the Yoruba, but it's Kwara for river, Kwara and tree, Kulu in Luo or Choli. And so in that same language, Jokulu, divine spirit. Um, and then ancestors, quaro, all the same consonant um, uh, sequences here. And so, but this is another lecture, and we'll get into that um, later. So, even with our man, good Sanetta, Sanetta, we all know our mans, Sanetta with the Sanetta TV, but he has the word netter. In Sanetter, meaning the son of God. And so if we wanted to say that in tree, they don't have the word sa or ser. They have oba. So remember that word we, we were talking about aquaba, akuaba, ba meaning child. The word oba means son. So when you say akuaba, you know, uh, the, the uh, unk child. You know, that's what it says, or the child, the life of a child in Akua Badals in terms of the unk symbol. So now you have Oba and Toro. So when y'all hit up Saneta, call him Oba and Toro in the tree language. 
in in um in Chiluba we would say Mwana Nkole. So the son of God. Well Mana Nkola, Mala Mwana Ngola. And I forgot the A in the word Chiluba. Shame on me. But Sonetta, this is how you would say his name in tree. So y'all give him a West African Oba and Toro. But as you can see, he would not escape the word netter. So here's something that, you know, uh, a lot of folks may not be aware of. And so I discussed this in the text, but there's an aspect of this that I don't discuss in the text. And that is the, um, you know, what we talk about, what is a God or what is a spirit, so to speak. So you have a lot of people asking this question. And so in the religion and medicine of the God people, the God living in Ghana, they have this word wo or won. And he says, the author says, a won by God definition is anything that can work but not be seen and includes the smaller beings of specialized and limited activity associated with medicines and magic. This is the key criterion when we're talking about what a God or a spirit is. Because a God is some agent that has the ability to do work. And so that ability to do work is what we call energy. And we know that energy is the, um, it is a characteristic of matter. It describes, it is a, it is a, a, a fun, it's something that matter does how much energy uh, uh, some clump of matter has um, depends on its position, speed, where is it going, all other kind of stuff that we're dealing with in physics. But that underlying essence, that okra, that invisible force that holds up things, that makes things to be able to work and do things is what a wall, is what a spirit is. It is anything that can do work and not be seen. The word energy is the same word for power. They're synonymous in terms of language. In physics, they're referred to different things, but um, but they're ultimately related and relatable. But linguistically speaking, the word energy and the word power refer to the same concept. And so when we talk about Allah, a power, we're talking about the ability to do, to make, to do work. And so when you see that word kra work to hold up things, that's what we're talking about here. But even this word wo and wo is a variant of the word nature. And so I'm going to prove it to y'all. And I already proved it in uh, Alluja Volume 2. But there's an aspect of this I put didn't put in uh, Luja Volume 2. And that's what we're going to get into. But here is this word iwin, a god. Uh, um, a epithet for Osiris, and you, you, I think it's you know even uh, pillar is associated with Osiris. So remember what we said: Osiris is associated with the Djed pillar, and so this word Ewin also means pillar and pole. In other words, nature. In the Yoruba, Ewin ancestors, ghosts, spirits, Ingas, Wong ancestors, the living dead shades, and the Bachama. Wong, the demigod in charge of the dead, the demigod in charge of the kingdom of death. Who is that? Osiris. We already seen this up here in um, Egyptian. So the Bachama are people who allegedly speak a Afro-Asiatic language, but these, you know, they, we know there's no Afro-Asiatic, but these folks live in Nigeria. And so Osiris among the Bachama is Wong. The demigod in charge of the dead. Everybody knows that Osiris is in charge of the dead. And he's the king. He's the he's the um the head of the dead. When you get judged in the kingdom of death, you go to Osiris among the Bachama, you go to Wong. But this is nature. Let's prove it. So in Egyptian, that WN consonant sequence. We can prove this here. So we already demonstrated that the word um, nature 
derives from a K or a K, actually a KT, uh, and, and in some instances a KS consonant sequence. But um, in terms of the, the relations that we see, it corresponds in Chiluba to KL. And in Chiluba, we have all these words here. So, for example, wind, desert hair, kalula, kalulu, rabbit, wind to open, kanuna to open, wind to exist, to become essence. Remember that the kra is the essence, it's the, it's the existing part of the being. In Chiluba, the kra is called bui kadi, the essence to be, from ikala to be. When, when, to move to and fro. Jikula, remove, move away. Winech, forest, fortress. And so this T suffix here nominalizes a verb. So the verb here is bikole, to be strong, very strongly with strength. So if we put chikole, it could be the equivalent to fortress here. But in when, a god, pillar, the epithet for Osiris. Incole, inquele, God. By incole, spirits, ghosts. Iwin, pillar, column. Remember that Osiris is associated with the Dejek column and pillar. And as I discussed in um, Nesubiti, the whole, the whole concept of Osiris has to deal with this notion of being upright, being stable, being reliable, etc. And all of this is this talk... Um, um, you know, um, discussed in Illusion Volume 2. So we have Iwen, Pillar, Column, Chikunji, Column, Stake, Kikongo, and Mukulu, Pole. So again, this KL, the Netcher, Pole, Cloth, we did all this, it's all the same. In, Ch in Chiluba, Variant, Mukuna, Mountain, Hill. In Jileke, Pole, the inverse, the consonant inverse. Leke is Kele, Jikele, and so this happens a lot in Chiluba, where the syllables are inverse. So the iwun, the wun of this is just another variation of the word nature. And it's another variation word win, iwin in e Egyptian. And the Bachama in Nigeria worship Osiris in the form of wun. Because that's one of Osiris's names, iwin, iwon. And so I could go on for days, but that's why I write books. And so I'm not going to unshamelessly plug. I'm not going to shamelessly plug. I'm going to unshamelessly plug. So get your hands on Eluja Volume 2. Go to the website and purchase your copy. Because the whole text is about the connections between West Africa, Central Africa, South Africa, and ancient Kemet. You have over 550 pages of that data. So Eluja, Volume 2, and then, of course, my 2016 work, Nesubiti, King and Ancient Egyptian. So you see the big size difference. But nonetheless, they're both... Uh, impactful uh, nonetheless so again if you want to make your ex-girlfriend jealous get Aluja volume 2 you want to make your mans jealous get Aluja volume 2 you want to make your homeboys jealous get Aluja volume 2 and so did I mention to get Aluja volume 2 okay enough of that already anyway um that is the end of my presentation. So uh, I really wasn't paying attention to the comments. So I don't know if anyone's asked any questions or had any um, comment, so to speak. So if anybody wants to ask a question, Ask your questions. And so, if we had a lot of people, yep, yep, yep. 
Yeah, I don't see any questions going all the way up. So I will wait. I know there's a time delay. So um, I appreciate. Uh, <laughs> I appreciate everyone who is, you know, listening and, you know, uh, those who have donated. Um, I don't know if anyone else has donated, but if you did and I didn't say your name, I do apologize. I can't um, I can't see. I can't retro see. But um, thanks to, you know, all the people who are listening live and all of those who um, are catching the archive. So I check, you know, the the comments uh, periodically. So if you have a question and you you weren't listening live, you know, or a comment, you know, put it in the comment section. Uh, please um, like the video. Please share the video. Uh, debate the issues in the video. You think I'm wrong and full of ish? Then go ahead and say it, but share the video while you're saying it. And, um, and you know, hit that like button. So I'm going to see if there's any uh, in terms of Aluja. Yeah, there'll be other volumes of Aluja. And so my my good my my objective is to you know go through a lot of the major concepts in ancient kemet and then reanalyze them and if i find you know a lot of good uh if i discover anything major you know in reference to west and central africa and how they feed you know, the knowledge of both or, or, or all these areas in combination will illuminate one another, then I will collect those and put them in in a third volume. And so, um, but yeah, but the, the next Aluja volume, actually, it's not going to be an Aluja. It's simply going to be the, it's, it's a chapter that I was going to include in Aluja volume two. However, the it is it is too much information for me to tackle it in one chapter. And so the book is going to be called Quantum Mechanics as African Heritage. And so I'm going to show the rudimentary evolution of quantum mechanics in Central Africa, in West Africa, and in ancient Kemet. And to suggest that if they would have been left to their devices, we would have been in the modern understanding of quantum mechanics. But everything that we understand in general in terms of quantum mechanics already existed in these places and not in a superficial way, in a very scientific way. And so... Um, I couldn't do it justice with just an article in Aluja. So that's going to be its own book. So quantum mechanics as African heritage. And um, so that's in the future. So let me see. Um, uh, and thank you all for saying uh, good job. Uh, Vayesa, Nicolay Gula, you said I have a question. Um, let me see. Um, any further volumes to look out? Is it possible that in Latin based languages, families, Latin based language families, that Yoruba could be spelled Uruba? Um, I have no idea. I don't really have an answer for you there. Uh, uh, Vayasa. Um, I'm, I'm sure in those languages, see, I don't know what Uruba means. So we would have, and matter of fact, we don't even know what Yoruba means. So it's it's still a debate of where the word Yoruba comes from. So um, were there any tribes from ancient Egypt and South Africa today? Um, it's, it's rumored the Zulus, but Zulus, they're, before they, they're, they're more immediate um, travels was coming out of like Ethiopia and the Great Lakes region um, into South Africa. But there are 
there is some circumstantial evidence that these folks were in Egypt and the Sudan and that the the Zulus is kind of one of those mixed bunches for a group of Nilots that migrated out of uh, Moro and Sudan and met up with Bantu speaking folks and they intermingled and adopted Bantu as a language and then the Zulus came down and you know did their things in, in history so this is that's some research that i'm doing and it, it's it's looking promising along those lines um but you know but right now um that's my answer so uh you see is mount manu oh no oop, it skipped is mount manu far west of egypt manu manu i don't know i don't know i can't answer that question um and about a word kum if you know anything about these cuz i might be able to tie these geographic locations during the early colonial periods uh of south america yeah you you're probably going to have to write out this this stuff uh vayasa and and so I can kind of get a, a better sense of what you're what you're talking about and doing here. Um, you went in great presentation. I will catch the replay this weekend. Looking forward to it. Thank you, Kiri and Zane Montego. Good adventure. Thank you. In volume two of Aluja, you were saying the pronunciation of Egyptian words were were altered on purpose to sound more Semitic to hide the Bantu relationship. Can you touch upon? Him? Um, no, I did not say that in Illusion Volume Two. Um, no, I didn't. I didn't say that at all. So I, I don't know how to respond, and I don't know what you were reading. Um, if you if you can give me the page number, if, if I don't know if you highlighted what you said, but uh, I know I didn't say that, um, or at least I did not intend to say that. So if you can give me, if you can catch it and find the um, the the page number and cite it, I will I will respond. Um, I guess I think Bangoni coming from Inquan and properly South Sudan. I yet to research Kemet people were referred to as Bona Bakula Basikimu. Yeah, I'm familiar with that. Uh, the Bona Bakula Basikimu. Um, Hotep Asar, how do you feel about the new ancestors they found a couple of years ago? 22 mummies found ancestral robbery in Egypt recently. I mean, it's all ancestral robbery. We know white folks are grave robbers. Um, it is what it is. Uh, why was the Niger River once called the Nile? Um, I don't know who called it. Who called it the Nile? That's the question. Um, we see senator incense in the language. Want to talk about any connections with what you did today? Um, well, the 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 word incense. Uh, for instance, it has to deal with some kind of risings or something to this nation, but it's also could probably dealing with the wood um, in those areas. And so it is because of incense that I think that the word ta netter really refers to. They say the place of gods, but the word ta netter, uh, so called land of gods, is never terminated with any um, uh, netcher glyph, netcher determinative. And so this 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 tonnetter may actually more so be dealing with places of resources. And so this is where you will find these incense, these woods for the incenses uh, that they that they would burn. And so that's what I think with tonnetter, but it has nothing to do with uh, like the land of the gods, so to speak. But um, let's see, is there anything else? How long have we been going? 9 30, 10 30, 11 30, 12. So three hours now. And uh, I may have a little time to do. I'll put the invite, I'll share. So if anybody wants to come on and make any comments, uh, they can. So I think I have up to five or six on oh, my free version of StreamYard. Uh, so but the the uh the link is in the chat and so uh i, I know it's going to be a second so i'll just wait a few minutes 
we'll wait a few seconds to see if anybody has a question or if you know anybody wants to join the conversation so hold on as i drink this purified water um the earth's finest and you're welcome in june money um thanks for saw lots of good affirming and reaffirming information have a great weekend peace peace to you too as well mm. do you think the recent argument to separate west africa from kimmy is because of all the pseudo and misinformation on kimmy in the community i think it's a variety of information one i think it's just hating is one and you know we can have a gang of pseudo information about west africa but you won't see them talk about you know let's stop talking about west africa because there's a whole bunch of pseudo information dealing with west africa um it's it's just certain people that just doesn't like the fact that there are certain people whose interest and specialty is ancient Kemet. and uh you have individuals everyone who who tries to make this argument that there's no connection between west africa and ancient Kemet are all the people who don't study ancient Kemet or west africa they have no knowledge whatsoever of these of these cultures, these languages, anything about history, none of this. And so you notice that when they say stuff, they never provide any evidence or argumentation uh, for their argumentation. It's always hypotheses that have yet to be worked out. And so it is there is no reason. And so um, somebody made the note that you notice that all the people who are hating on um, Egypt are also people who have now have this newfound atheism as well. And so this is one of the reasons why I, I stress this emphasis on, on the gods and how you find the same gods in West Africa. We dealt with Sekhmet two weeks ago. You know, um, we, we deal with Shango because Shango comes from Sudan you know, in that migration of those Smiths that came into Oya uh, region. And so, you know, there's a variety of things that is 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 possibly the reason. But um, they, you know, they will use the excuse of, of pseudoisms behind it. But if the, if the information was pseudo, they would have to um, you know, it depends on what the question, what's the research question in which these people are talking about being pseudo in. And so, you know, you just don't dismiss the whole the whole country of of, of Egypt because there are a few people who who have some misinformation about Egypt. And so even within that uh, in that context, you know, they don't because they don't study Egypt. And they're not African centered. So notice this as well. Every single person who um, who has this animosity towards the correlation between West Africa and Egypt, not one of them are African centered. They're not African centered researchers because they know if you in, if you understand Afrocentricity, you know that. Uh, hold on one sec as I add someone to the conversation. Boom. Peace, brother Wujawu. Your mic peace. What's going on? Peace, peace, peace. Uh, can peace. you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay, hello. I, I think I have you. Um, uh, I think I have you. Okay, there you go. You get me? Okay, yeah, yeah. Because uh, this storm yard is fairly new to me. All right, yeah. I'm just here, man. That was a, that was a good presentation. I'm just here, uh, popping in because you gave the link, and I'm here for all the smoke. That's all. <laughs> As you can see, people don't notice this, but but behind my name right here that people have always seen, that's smoke. So I'm 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 here for all the smoke at all times. People didn't even know it. But anyway, I'm just I'm just here. But that was a good presentation. I think that anybody that um goes back or because you you gave a lot of information, so people are gonna have to double back and watch it again, really, um, a few times because I don't I really don't understand how anybody can uh, try to refute these connections because, you know, language is a, is a big, big helpful tool to understand the connections between cultural facts, cultural items, and not, you know, this biological reality that they try to stay within. You know, I, I, I heard you, I heard somebody ask you before, 
uh, about where, you know, where the source of, of the kind of conflicts are from and, 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 and people who are trying to make this conflict up, they're trying to stay within a biological argument and, and you just can't. And so, you know, anyway, but yeah, I'm just saying good, good, good thing. And again, I'm, I'm here for all the smoke. I've always been, it's been, been, it's been right on my name. I got the whole smoke cloud behind me all the time. So anyway. Indeed, indeed. I'll just uh, continue my point um, from earlier. And what I was saying is that there, everyone who has these animosities or whatnot, none of them study ancient Kemet in any serious way. And none of them study West Africa in any serious way. And, you know, as I was saying, none of them are African centered because in the African centered enterprise, we don't study just to study. We, we're not scholars for, we don't do scholarship for scholarship's sake. We, we, the, the, the charge of Afrocentricity, you know, outside of the scholarship, outside of a way to evaluate, you know, writings concerning African people is to recover information that is usable for us today and to incorporate it into your personal lives. That's what Afrocentricity charges. And so you have people who are African centered in their orientation who not only study ancient Egypt and say, oh, they did this and they did that. They they adopt the values. They adopt the, the culture, the language. They adopt the rituals because these are the things that we lost when they're trying to figure out what is authentically African. In the sense of that, it was it was uh before the europeans and things of this nature that one of the places that we go to is ancient kemet because ancient kemet they wrote vigorously and on everything about everything you know love poetry cheating contracts trade building mathematics philosophy spirituality religion politics and so if we want to get a sense of that Africanness prior to colonization, you have to go to Kimmy because it is the oldest and it has the most material. And so for those of us who are African-centered, we do African-centered research, we know that we always have a base to do comparisons. And then we go into West Africa and we do our studies and we do our comparisons and things of this nature. You'll find, and this is, this is what trips me out about uh, people who are hating on people who deal with um, ancient Kemet and and uh, or whatnot is that one most of them never been to Kemet. Matter of fact, I'm, I'm, of all the people I'm thinking about, none of them have been to Kemet. Two, the people they don't realize that the people who study Kemet are all they also deal with West African spiritual traditions and things of that nature. And also visit West Africa and get initiated into priesthoods and things of that nature. So they, for example, you can hate Jabari all you want, but Jabari has been to West Africa more times than any of these detractors and deals with a whole bunch of stuff and with the people in West Africa. When it comes to the squad, you know, um, in terms of the squad, I know that is is the only people who have went to to Kemet is myself and um, brother Smash, and then you can also include, even though he ain't in the group anymore, brother Ben. But besides myself and Sanjetti, we're initiated, and brother Ben are initiated into West African systems. Brother Ben has been to uh, uh, Senegal and South Africa and working on his way into Nigeria for some more initiations. Uh, Dr. Maat, all in, I uh, think she was in South Africa in, in, in West Africa as well. You know, the whole squad travels around in these places and we deal with West Africa on a real life basis. And so what they don't understand is that because they're not involved in African systems, there's nothing in the, the unwritten bylaws 
in African traditions that you can't uh, adhere to more than one tradition. That's something that they got to realize. There's nothing in the ancient Egyptian um, uh, text that says that you have to follow everything of, of ancient Kemet if you went ancient Kemet. There's nothing in the Ifa corpus. There's nothing in the Akan corpus. There's nothing amongst the the the, the Fulani in, in Mali in there in the um, Bambara traditions. There's nothing in Congo. There's nothing in Zulu. All everybody is initiated and gets initiated and borrows from and studies various African traditions. You matter of fact, it's almost required of you to do so. And so I'm going to re-emphasize this point in an article that I'm submitting to Brother Ben's um, journal to, to show that people are out of pocket. And so if they want to, uh, uh, as an agent, as a free person, as an agent, study ancient Kimmin and incorporate ancient Kimmin into their lives, they have the right to do so because that's what African people do. And so African people syncretize other African traditions. And so this wasn't just an issue of the diaspora. When, when we were brought over here, we're taking our African traditions and, and, and mixing it with uh, Catholicism and church and all this other kind of stuff. That stuff happens within Africa, within their own traditions. Which is why this, this, this proverb always reigns supreme. That, you know, a child who has never left home says my mother is the best cook. It's the Bayeru people in Central Africa. It is required of you to travel and study under folks and to get initiated into different guilds. Because in Africa, in African wisdom traditions, the more you know, the more powerful you are. The more initiations you have from abroad and studies that you have from abroad and you come back into the village, the more powerful you are seen as. And so because Garfield and, and Chief X and Brother Unk and all these other individuals don't study and aren't involved in Africa in any serious way, they don't know this stuff. Because once you get involved in this stuff and you know these things, then it's it you see how silly the conversation is, you know, to to not study and deal with uh, ancient Kemet because you come from West Africa. Ancient Kemet came to West Africa. And so we deal with it all because it's African. And so I'll just end there uh, in terms of my ranting. I don't even know if any other questions was coming. You have anything to say, Brother Wujawu? I'm just here for the smoke. <laughs> no, no, no. I don't have anything to add. Um, yeah, I really don't. Um, I look at the conversations that I've been seeing as I can look at it two ways. I see, you know, a, a group of guys having fun. You know, that's what happens when you may not have much else to do or whatever, you know, and I, I get that. But, um, you know, I don't. I don't think it's um, it's very helpful, though, in the long run, because it kind of disturbs, you know, what people are studying, what people should study, because people's time is of the essence. A lot of people don't have a lot of time. So the little bit of time that a lot of us have, we want to be pointed in the right direction so we don't feel like we're wasting time. And so when when stuff like these kind of conversations happen, people get unsure and they get turned off. And then it just becomes like I've been calling it. It becomes a big circus, a big chaotic, you know, brawl. And so hopefully that could change. But I don't have anything to add add to that. Uh, we have somebody who came on the line, Radio One. I'm about to uh, um, plug you in. So here we go. Are you there? Radio One. Um, your mic is not muted, so if you're talking, your mic is not working. Oh, he went out. Oh, well. Um, the link is in the chat for anybody who wants to join. You have any questions, you want to 
say something live. Uh, someone asked, am I wrong if I say that Kemet was a metropolis, a blended population or, or multiple tribes? I would not say that you're wrong. Anything, uh, Brother Wujawu? I know we was talking about this earlier. Yeah, we were. Um, I did a post because in the conversations, I just felt like people needed to be reminded that that Kemet, that ancient Egypt or Kemet should never be seen as this homogeneous single family or DNA haplo group of people. You know, it's a it's a confederation or it's a result of people um, conspiring, <laughs> coming together and unifying, you know, and so they so you have this simultaneous distinction that's that's put in the back burner and then you have this this simultaneous um unification so you have multiplicity in the unity and unity in the multiplicity that balance it out so well that they lasted for over three thousand years and so people have to be reminded of that um from time to time because people are arguing as if egypt is this homogeneous biological haplo group that you can tell migrated from east coast to west coast and things like that so but the metropolis the only thing i'll say about the metropolis is that kemet had multiple metropolis if we if we use the word metropolis for what it is like a large city it had it had a few of those so kemet is more so like a kingdom um but the second part of his thing is is all is definitely correct you know all right. All right. We're going to try to bring Radio One back in. Okay. It seems like we can hear you now. Yes. Peace, brother. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Peace, peace. Hey, hey what's going on, brother? Uh, I want to congratulate you on your presentation, man. Uh, I enjoyed the uh, information and. Um, oh. Everything was I, 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 um, you're breaking up very bad, and I can't understand anything that you're saying. Okay, it seems like you went back out again. Um, you you have a bad connection. Um. Yeah, I don't know what to say at this point. Uh, I'll just remove from screen and see if he'll, you know, come back in later if he has a problem. So I'm just going to go back to the chat. Um, let me see what this is. Uh, uh, that problem with calling it a metropolis is most of the people lived in the country. Yeah, I mean, because we're thinking of metropolis or city in the modern say, you know, they didn't have they wouldn't have had cities in the way that we think of a city today. And so uh, but, you know, I, I get what he was trying to say. The word that I would use more so is that it's a confederation and the, the it's a confederation of villages of, of, of smaller states that was amalgamated into one um country over time um and and became you know the 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 egypt that we know but these were individual polities of related and relatable people and some who were you know new immigrants as a result of the drying of the sahara into that area and you know some historical events happened some people from the south and tasseti you know took over and created and took over what is the southern part of Kemet. And then they went further and, and conquered in the north and then unified these places. And then you get this 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 strong pharaonic um, e e Egyptian history from that point on. They tried to go further south into the, the Sudan and met some resistance there. But later on, they finally conquered them. And but then later on, those same folks came and and ruled egypt during the 25th dynasty and you know it's just a lot of back and forth in terms of his borders and things of that nature but it's it's more so i would use confederation but i understood exactly what uh uh the the person meant so 
Let me see. In other words, nobility is a must. In other words, not everybody was kings and queens because somebody had to be a peasant or a slave. Um, who ever made the argument that everybody were kings or queens? You know, um, even it, no one that I know has ever made that argument. And we definitely don't make that argument here, but we could definitely say that uh, Kemet was full of gods because these are people who are experts, who are craftsmen, who are specialists. And this is what this title adheres to people who create people who had authority they had a civilization and so while you know the concept of king um or whatnot is a administrative position and of course everybody's not uh, a, a king or queen at least in their household they was and so at least in their household they were in terms of being priest even if they didn't have a political uh post as priest because every there's always somebody the adults in the household who are responsible for the individual rituals in the household and, and uh, placating the ancestors and spirits for the family. And so they're kings and queens of their home. Okay. I saw our connection was good today. <laughs> There's an ancient river that went east and west. Uh, okay, no buzzing. Only white people who claim past lives as Egyptians through hypnosis are somehow always kings and queens, never peasants. Yeah, I mean, you know, anybody who I know who is a um, who is a comedic, so-called comedic practitioner, you know, they're not running around saying that they were kings. If anything, the, the the highest title that they will adhere to and say that they are a priest, even when you talk about Jab Jabari, the highest thing that he says is that he's a priest. You know, although a king can be a priest, you know, that's usually what you see. There's only one individual that I know who uses the title Nesubiti as a king, and that's over. He's the head over the shrine in Jersey. Um, but nobody else that I know that I could think of off the top of my head you know, calls themselves or, uh, or associates themselves with kingship in terms of, a uh, um, ancient Kemet. Well, except whoever this person is in the chat, whose name is Nesu Bitti Amenhotep. So he's claiming to be a king. So here's one of your Kings, uh, in the chat, Nesu Bitti Amenhotep. He says, is it possible that one of the groups of people in Kemet was a group of West Africans? And see, that's something that people don't even want to entertain that is not so much in every instance that ancient Egyptians migrated west, but if the Egyptians are trading and dealing with people who are in Central and West Africa, why would it be a uh, far-fetched to say that these Egyptians were traveling west, excuse me, traveling east and, and settling in the Nile Valley? And we have some genetic studies that suggests just that but that's another conversation for another time which is why i want to keep it on the east to west migration uh, for those who say that there's no connections but there's definitely some some conversation to be had some evidence some direct and circumstantial evidence that it is in many instances it's the other way around you know but uh, uh okay we have radio one back so let me add him into the conversation and uh you there yeah can you hear me yeah i can hear you yeah i lost my connection last time um yeah i just want to say man um yeah i think i think brothers like you and uh you know brothers who are scary with regard because you know he's been talking a lot of nonsense man so nobody really attacked him yet, and you know, um, just he talked. It's like your your connection is very very bad. It's like it is. Uh, I'm sorry. He, he's still up here saying that. So, uh, yeah, you're you're coming uh, in in and out. Well, and, Hold on, Radio One. Radio One. 
Hold on, hold on. Ready so, one. No, can you hear me? Um, um I, I just don't know what, what he's doing. I know you you you're he's sounding scary, like you know, he, you, you're sounding like me, man. It's like uh struck this and in and it's in Ooh. Hello. Uh, I didn't mean to click him off. I was just trying to mute his mic so I could tell him that uh you know he sounds like a dying Autobot on the uh on the call. And so someone says is a call in is it's I don't think it's a call in on StreamYard. I think Zoom has the call in feature, but I have not seen that feature for StreamYard. So no one can call in. So if you want to talk, you're going to have to um, put in the, or you have to join via the link. And so if Radio One is listening, if you have a comment, just say it in the chat. I will read it and respond to it. Um, so do you think when the Fulani went to the Middle East, they mixed with those white Syrians and Hittites and became olive skinned Hebrews and Arabs? Exactly. That's exactly what happened. And, you know, this is what we talk about in Illusion. This is what, um, in many respects, uh, Jean-Claude Mboli talks about, but from a linguistic perspective. And in, in terms of the formation of Semitic and ultimately Indo-European. And also, you know, um, Modupe Oduyoye in this text here, the one I showed in the, in the text. So that's where I got the what's the name from. Um, talks about the Fulani moving back and forth in front of North Africa, Egypt, and into the Middle East. They mix. So there's like Fulani, like you can tell a Fulani in West Africa, but you can also not tell a Fulani in West Africa because they intermingle with in, with with other Africans, you know, saying there, they've adopted the uh, uh, West African languages and um, in terms of ones that are close to Wolof and things of this nature. And so... Um, it is it's kind of hard to place them you know in 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 history but these folks they have a wide distribution in terms of their populations and just like there's some who are still nomadic to this day and then there's some who settled and so there you know the 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 story of the hebrews and canaanites and some of these people are akin to your fulani uh folks who were dealing with those people who were indigenous to that area and you may have some of those people who are indigenous in that area that you know moved into Africa, and 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 mixed in with people who are in Egypt, people who are in North Africa become your Berbers and stuff to this nature. And so it, it's kind of a it's a kind of a back and forth thing. And so you know they don't have they didn't have modern borders like we have today. And and there's nothing that said they didn't say a sign that says you know you are now in Africa and. You know, you're not allowed here. You know, they didn't have a Trump border wall, you know, saying to keep, you know, people out and in. And so people were migrating in and out. Egypt is a confluent zone. And so they had some difficulties in terms of the what is the Delta, because for a while it was swamps, you know. And so you would have to come in through some oasis under and then go out. But, you know, that dried and, you know, more population started you know, just dwelling into the Delta area and things. And so it's a very complex history. And so this is why it's, it's, it's critical to do these comparative studies with, uh, in terms of West Africa, Central Africa, South Africa, et cetera, so that you can see what aspects of their language, as access of their culture and spirituality is indigenously African. And then what came from um, the Middle East? Because there's some things in ancient Kemet that comes from the Middle East. It comes from Asia. And so not everything that is in ancient Kemet is born there. They borrowed some things, you know, from these other areas. Not even really so that they borrowed. It is, what happens is, is that migrants from Asia came into Egypt and settled. And they bring their culture with it. And so them doing their own synchronizations in the Delta in areas like that emerges with Egyptian. It becomes part of the Egyptian larger scheme in, in culture and things of that nature. So, you know, this is how we got to think about these things. Um, 
Line to red, save your question. Anything you want to say, brother Wujawu? I'm just here for the smoke. <laughs> no, no, um, no, not at all. Um, I was trying to make out what the brother was saying, Radio One was saying, um, but yeah, he was coming in and out, and hopefully he'll be able to type his comment in there. Cause it's not like he had, a, he was building up a, a nice uh, question. <laughs> well, um, if I don't see any, what is the name of the book I just held up? It is the sons of gods and the daughters of men, an Afro-Asiatic interpretation of Genesis one through eleven. Doctor Mudope Modupe Oduoye. And this book is old. It is coming off, as you can see. Uh, so I have really messed up my book, but that's just how I do, you know, with with the with the text. But if there's no, you know, saying questions and commentary, it's already one o'clock in the morning on the East Coast, and we started around nine thirty. So I don't want to make it too long. And I have a, a question for you. Um, I know I know you've done some work with the actual um form god you know god as a, uh -huh. as a as a form of the word and tracing it back it's like ha it has this obscure etymology you know and when you look it up in in etym etymological dictionaries some say it points to libation some say it points to um invoking or to call yeah but have you ever done um any work with the Greek uh, coining of Theos or Theos and things like that? No, I haven't, but Jean Claude and Boley has. And, you know, because ultimately I think the word Theos comes from a word meaning to shine. It's like it's, it's associated with like the sun. And so it's like this, this kind of idea of, of like brilliance, you know, saying the shine or majesty. That's where that comes in. But even the word God in um, English, it is the word kudos in Greek. And so in my analysis, I, I, I go through all of that. And so um, I'm using a more updated etymology of the word God from, you know, Proto-Indo-European uh, linguist. And so before the, the problem was, you know, they would make these arguments about libations and um and to invoke and all of this other kind of stuff but you notice that in the languages that this stuff is supposed to be cognate the word for the poor or to speak or to liberate or whatever or even to sacrifice all of these are totally separate words so if if these words evolved from there in these languages they would they would be the same you know because they're the same word. So uh, how does the, the word sound the same in all the languages for God? But then when it comes to the actual words that mean to either pour, invoke, um, to sacrifice, you know, or to call or whatnot, all of those words are different in all the languages. So this is this is a key that they got this wrong. And so um, but when I when I look through the system um uh, proto indo european database is the the process in which they did it was a lot more rigorous and it's from there that i use in comparing and now was able to you know line everything in terms of uh, of nature and things of that nature but i have to reevaluate not reevaluate but re uh read and reassess um in Boley's analysis you know saying on that term and um to see what he says but i can't wait for his upcoming book because even still even still those those works that he did in um the origin of african languages 2010 were just preliminary stuff and so but yeah but to answer your question in a very short nutshell no i have not uh, remember to like the video and share da -da -da -da. to america um, yeah, I'm not seeing anything. So, uh, I appreciate everyone who is in the chat, the people who are listening live, who hung out with me these hours. 
uh, people who have donated, people who have purchased the book, people who are going to purchase the book, because I know all of y'all are going to purchase the book and y'all going to be the envy of your friends and family. And it's going to, you know, cause jealousy in your personal relationships because you have the book and they don't. But um, I appreciate you all. I appreciate Brother Bujawu for, you know, um, joining the panel, giving his commentary and uh, everyone for listening again. Hold on. Sorry, Motep. I had a lot to say, but I know your teachings will soon make Garfield and Unk have a change of heart because they know they have nothing to refute it. Um, you know, we'll see. You know, people just like, like to argue. And, you know, this has been uh, this has been a contention. It really kind of starts with Team Osiris. You know, these are the arguments that they would make. But it, it, was, uh, it always be strange that everybody we talk about, we ain't got no connection to West Africa, but be using West African names. I mean, excuse me, we have no time to East Africa in, in terms of H. Kemet, but use comedic names. So Team Osiris, Brother Unk. You know, saying, for example, now he, Rob Bourne said the rock comes from somewhere else, but I don't believe him. Um, but Garfield's just Garfield. So he don't you know, he doesn't fit into that. And then you have Chief X, you know, uh, who's associated with the God best. You know, the God uh, best incarnated. Yeah. You know, he's the God best incarnated. So now he he ain't got nothing to do with uh, Egypt no more. And so it's just like. I don't know, but they'll find something to argue with. They'll be like, well, this, no, no, no. And so this is what I mean. Like, this is this is outside of their lane. And because they don't deal with Africa, they don't. I have lots more that I could I could I could be on here on a Garfield eight hour show and just straight drop, you know, um, uh, evidence and jewels. But we just ain't got that much time. And so but, you know, the the difference in the, and this is something that you got to be mindful of as well. I don't research to argue with anyone. I research in the fields that I interest that, that I research because I have a genuine interest in the subject matter. So when when I make commentary about things, it's not because I heard someone on the um on a YouTube or I saw a post on Facebook and then I decided to go type and do some research on the subject i've already been studying this you know for a while so i i have a good sense of the literature um on the subject the arguments for and against the subject and so this is this this is what happens when you just jump out there and you haven't done any research yourself and this is what we always want to avoid so if if there's a if there's a subject matter that i don't understand or i have not um, research thoroughly. When people make controversial claims, I simply say or ask if they haven't done any research, they haven't written anything themselves, can you point me to your sources so that I may evaluate it and then come to a conclusion later? I'm just not going to come out there and say that you're wrong because I haven't studied, I haven't done the work. You know, and so this is something that a lot of us have a hard time doing. We just hear something that we just it it, it doesn't agree with our what what we believe to be true, and then we attack it. And and that's something that we we have to not do. We have to understand our own limitations and understand really, you know, if, if we and 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 be true to ourselves and know that when we haven't studied something thoroughly, that we haven't read these 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 source materials and stuff and so we just don't come out you know just because we have a phone you know in hand and we have the ability to record and say something that you say something just because you can and so there's a this is a whole field of study there's there's dozens upon dozens of scholars who have been researching and asking these questions for decades this isn't you know there's certain things a lot of this research you know that I'm doing is either original or building off of something but this this is what we do and so y'all should know me by now I just don't accept anything just cuz you know, I, I look at it thoroughly 
And, and I can tell when something is circumstantial, where something is versus where something is direct. But it's it's I know the process of creating and making an entire argument and knowing how little pieces of circumstantial evidence in in various different areas put together help us to see a more complete argument. And so I never make an argument based on one thing. But um, hold on. Thanks for mentioning the book, Asar. I've been immortalized in this great work and greatly honored. You're welcome. Uh, apologies, Unc Benny, my phone did that. What happened? Where did your phone do it again? I missed it. Uh, did he use your comment? Oh, what? No worries. You can do no wrong. <laughs> um, what do you think about the moronic script not being able to be translated don't the Nubians today still retain their ancient language? Uh, you got to remember that people, just because they were able to do something in the past, their ancestors, doesn't mean that they're able to do it now. And so, you know, for example, we come, African Americans come from traditions that did metallurgy and knew how to build furnaces and to make these kind of artifacts for the most part african americans lost those traditions we don't know how to do it anymore and that tradition is is dying all across africa because we have machines now that can make metal objects and instruments so there's no need to go put a furnace you know out of mud and all this other kind of stuff and 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 forge an iron hole in modern times so that that tradition is dying so that's a that's a technique and technology that is lost and so um you know due to circumstances like even the ancient egyptians the, the people who claim to be egyptians and living in this they don't know they don't have an idea in terms of the language in terms of pronunciation being able to read and all this other kind of stuff so people lose the ability to do stuff shirkan to diop talks about this all the time chancellor williams amos wilson for example you know there's there's no there's no such thing as i mean there's a such thing as progress but there's also such a thing as regress and and cultures and things can regress over time and so it just is it is what it is when you don't have a, a need and a tradition to keep those writings and things alive it dies out and so that stuff is replaced by islam and you know and in those areas you know, in the eyes of Muslims, all of that will, will for the prophet Muhammad is, is evil and you shouldn't do it. So people will abandon it. And so the language may exist or a related language may exist in the area, but they wouldn't know to look towards Marotic. Although that might not also be true, but I'm keeping that a secret. And brother Unc Benu knows what I'm talking about keeping that a secret until the future. But speaking of the Marotic script, um, where is my other book that I'm writing? Uh, this is the book that's going to come out at the end of this month, beginning of April, uh, a com towards a comparative dictionary of Chicom and modern African languages. And so that article on God is going to be in there and I'm waiting on some feedback from some other linguists uh, who, who is checking my work on that. And when, once I finish that, that will be included in the text. But also included in the text is um, an analysis of Marotic. And so I'm doing Marotic, a Marotic, I can't even read backwards. Um, erotic and Sumerian comparisons, a preliminary analysis. And so uh, I think I have demonstrated beyond a shadow of a doubt that there is a relationship between Sumerian and, and Marotic. And hopefully, you know, uh, Marotic, excuse me, Sumerian may help us to decipher, you know, more words and things in um, the Marotic language. And so we have enough deciphered Marotic words that we can at least try to match up some sounds in the language. And so uh, if I wasn't in, in school right now, I would dedicate, you know, most of my hours to that process in terms of deciphering 
the erotic skip. But this is my contribution for now. But anyway, so this is what's coming up soon. Um, he said, did you know Unk used to claim his DNA went back to Lower Egypt, but now he's saying something else? What's up with that? <laughs> uh, no. And, and Unk Beno said, yeah, word. Hold that close to your chest already. Uh, Asar, what do you say, folks who say your work can't be verified? Only you came to that conclusion. Well, first of all, anybody who says that hasn't read my work. And the only people who can say that my work hasn't been verified are people who don't know how to verify it. There are plenty of people in the world who can verify or falsify anything that I say in my text. And what people don't realize is before I publish my text, my texts are reviewed by scholars in the field. And so uh, some of them I name in the beginnings of the text. And so, you know, this this text, Illusion Volume 2, is going to kill a lot of that nonsense that you hear certain folks talk about, especially when it comes to um, the so-called Afro-Asiatic and its validity and things of that nature, because they want to make it seem like we're just some crazy Afrocentrist who are denying the mainstream scholarship. Well, now they're going to have to deal with the mainstream scholars who are arguing against Greenberg and his classifications and things of that nature. And so and what, what you also got to understand is I'm a different type of scholar and researcher. And so you have people who are. How should I say you have people who are historians in a sense uh, people who summarize text. Like when I look at, and, and this is no, this is no shade. I'm just, and, and I don't want this to be interpreted the wrong way. Like when you read like the University of Kemet Press text, those texts are really texts that kind of examines everyone's arguments and kind of summarizes them and they put their own analysis on the on the information that is being presented by other scholars. They're not researchers in the sense that they're producing new knowledge to be vetted by the scholastic community. And that's where I sit in this and why certain things are controversial to folks, because I'm one of those people who was on the frontier of knowledge. We're, I'm, I'm one of those individuals, Shekhan Diop was on the frontier of knowledge. Obinga was on the frontier of knowledge. Jean-Claude Mboli is on the frontier of knowledge. So we are, we are at, the, we are at the, the stage and the level where things are being argued out. And so because those types of critics aren't in this arena, they don't understand what goes on at the frontiers. And they don't even have the skill set to be able to evaluate and judge, which is why when they get into these arguments, the only thing they can do is appeal to authority of, of stuff that has been written in the past in judgments where over, over here, this is where the action is, where the, the arguments and debates are happening because of new knowledge on the periphery, new theories and processes of being argued and debated. And so we're not even in the same lane. We're not even in the same um, uh, uh, level of argumentation here. And now, so this is, I'm sorry, go ahead. Now I just want to say, this is where we hear key words that, that get overused. And everything you just said reminds me of, of a word that's tossed around a lot, which is the word consensus. And then the word, um, uh, you know, it's like source up or shut up and consensus. Those two things are running, are running, you know, among that, that kind of crowd. And they don't understand that, that they have a misunderstanding of consensus and they, they confuse consensus more so with, uh, uh, I would call it um, like what's popular versus 
what's actually been worked on and then agreed upon that kind of consensus versus just what's re repeated and popular. And then you have the source up or shut up situation where as long as whatever you're arguing is found somewhere else, then you're okay. Not, not realizing that you and the person that says the same thing could be 100% wrong. And so it becomes an issue of learning to discern. And so, you know, I guess where you are and, and others are at the frontier of, of producing knowledge, <clears throat> you have to definitely know how to learn to discern and actually use logic. And I think, I think logic and linguistics are two things and uh, yeah, linguistics and, and some subfields of it are two of the most slept things in our communities. You know, I don't think people use logic enough or even know what it is. And of course, with logic comes math. And so math, science, logic, linguistics, those that combination is 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 are the most slept on uh, tools that we could we could use. And it's, it's a shame. But I just wanted to point that out, that that consensus thing is what what you say reminds me of. Indeed. And I just want to read something. So this is cited on page 376 and 377. And it's actually from a text, Aerial Diffusion, Genetic Inheritance, um, subtitled Problems in Comparative Linguistics, edited by Alexandra Ockenvald. And um, R.M.W. Dixon, um, a linguist who specializes, for example, in uh, Australian-based la languages, um, he's talking about the the African languages. So I will read. Uh, matter of fact, I think I have the PDF on my. Um, let me see. Hold on one second. So y'all can follow along with me because I don't want to just read to you. Um, yeah, so I'm going to because this is this is going to be very important. And so where am I on page 376? Uh, mm, oh, let me go back up. Uh, 376. Here we go. Bumba clot. Okay. So I'm going to share my screen. So, okay. I'm going to do that. Uh, what is going on here? Oh, no, i got to add that back. Uh, yeah, add to screen. Yeah, I'm, I'm getting used to this uh, stream yard myself. There we go. So, um, I'm going to wait to see. Um, I'm just trying to wait to see if it shows up on the other screen. Uh, and five, four, three. Oh, no, it's not coming up on the. Are you looking at another device? Can you see if it comes up on the screen? Yes, it's on the public side. Yeah, uh, what you're sharing is on there. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Um, <laughs> so this is uh, from my text, uh, Aluja Volume Two, and but this is a uh, an analysis of Greenberg's methods, so to speak. And so this is this is other European linguists talking about Greenberg's methods. So. Discussing work on African languages, Dixon states, after reviewing the available literature 
an outsider is forced to conclude that the idea of genetic relationship and the term language family are used in quite different ways by Africanists and by scholars working on languages from other parts of the world. Both Demendal in chapter 13 and Hein and Kuteva in chapter 14 present the received opinion that there are in Africa four major language families. Notice that they're in quotes or genetically defined units in quotes. Niger Congo, Nilo Saharan, Afroasiatic, and Khoisan. In fact, Khoisan is regarded by those scholars who have studied it in most detail as a linguistic area consisting of several distinct genetic families. See, among others, Westfall, yada, yada. yada. Afroasiatic does appear to be one genetic unit, although full justification for this has yet to be published in integrated form. There are wide divergences of opinion concerning the status of Nilo Saharan. Um, for Niger Congo, all we can say is that there has so far been no principal justification for this as a language family. As Demendal states in section number three, by the criteria of regular sound correspondences among these languages and of, and of the reconstruction of protoforms, Niger Congo is not a proven genetic unity. It may well be that Heinen. Hein and Kateva say Greenberg's genetic classification of African languages is by now widely accepted, but being widely accepted, for example, among Africanists, does not equate with has been scientifically justified. And that's what I wanted to um, stop. Well, let me see. At the end of section one, we call it Nietzsche's methodological principle. And that that only after all the okay i'll continue at the end of section one we quoted dench's methodological principle that only after all other possible explanations for the shared features have been exhausted should they be taken to be a genetic inheritance the opposite procedure appears to have been followed by africanists at a first stage every sort of resemblance was taken as indicative of genetic connection Many of these are, in fact, typological or aerial similarities. So what they're saying here is that just because something is widely accepted does not mean that it's scientifically justified. And so this is the same argument that Obinga was making, the same arguments as Jean-Claude Mboli is making in, in terms of these Africanist linguists. And notice that uh, what they said here, that the idea, hold on. Uh, yeah, so it may be well that, um, no, 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 what's where? Um, I just read it. Hold on, uh, uh, let's see, you know, so I recall in this family defined as you know, uh, there's an access of the those being a be a line, you know, no. Okay. I just read what I was looking for and now I can't find it. After reviewing all the sentences. Okay, yeah, this is right at the beginning. My bad. So in, in relation to what we're saying here, it says discussing work on African languages, Dixon states, after reviewing the available literature, an outsider is forced to conclude that the idea of genetic relationship and the term language family are used in quite different ways by Africanists and by scholars working on languages from other parts of the world. So what he's saying here is that those Africanists, basically the school of Greenberg, they have a totally different concept, a fringe concept of what constitutes a language family and genetic relation in genetic um relationships. So these are other linguists saying this that the Africanists they're not doing historical comparative linguistics. That's something different that they're doing over there. And that these Africanists, when we're talking about Christopher Eric, we're talking about Greenberg, we're talking about you know Roger, Roger Blinch. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. That these guys have a totally different concept of what constitutes a genetic relationship, and this is not what the consensus is. Not the strategies used by linguists from around the world. That is what it's saying here. 
And so within that, and so within that context, you get this. Just because something is widely accepted does not equate that it has been scientifically justified. Niger Congo, Afroasiatic, Khoisan, and Nilo Saharan are unjustified language groupings and unjustifiable. And so when people try to argue with me about this subject, they look silly because they it's it's just like with the West Africa and East Africa. They don't study. And they don't know where to study. And, and they just keep finding these articles and stuff written by people who, who belong to the Greenberg School. So, of course, it's a consensus amongst them. But in terms of the world, um, all of these are fringe um, uh, language groupings. So, you know, now they have an issue with uh, Jean-Claude and Boley. Don't understand that Jean-Claude and Boley is using the standard method that linguists use to, to argue for um, genetic relationships. But because they don't do linguistics, it's, it's something outside of their purview. They don't understand this. So this is what I mean when I say that people, you know, make these comments because they're not on that that frontier of knowledge and they don't have the skills to evaluate what's on the frontier of knowledge and so it is it, quite telling nonetheless that's why i don't spend time arguing with these folks too much because i know what they have not read so but chapter nine of Alluja Volume 2 is just full of citations, just like what we just read, that demonstrate that none of those language families exist and there's no scientific justification for them. So um, I end on that note. Um, it says, my last question, if the Merotic language is the same as the Sumerian, would this support the claim made by ancient Greeks? that Mero was founded by Persian king Cambyses or not? Um, no, it would not, because this is done on a genetic language. So if, if, if it was started by Persians, you would assume that the Persians spoke Persian and that the Merotic language would have been deciphered because we know Persian in its languages. So it's, it's, I don't know where that comes from, but, um, you know, again, knowing how to justify languages in terms of their genetic unity, that would have been done if that was the case. And I doubt it uh, very seriously. So. Uh, so peace, peace to you, brother uh, Ramesu. Peace to everyone again in the in the chat. June Money, Zane, Sean P. Radio, TJ, Unc Benu, and the whole clan, Sister Emiket, TJ and uh everyone else so um again we've been going on for a while now this is probably four hours now so um i'm i'm going to uh get off and wish you all well thank you for uh joining thank you for your support again keep the conversation going uh press the like button share talk and debate amongst your 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 friends and colleagues and um we will uh see you next time and so thanks to brother ramesu for the uh the the donation is greatly appreciated and so uh people don't understand it takes a while to put these presentations together and uh even if you have the information already so you know this uh will help uh keep us going and so in the future i plan on doing more sit down interviews and more um some 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 better in terms of presentations in terms of, of of video quality and stuff to that nature so this all contributes uh to that and so thank you again thank you all for listening thanks you to brother Bujawu, and i will end the broadcast now <laughs>